The stars are also realigning here with the interest rates, with the banks, with the debt ceiling. The Fed is dealing not just with a domestic inflation problem, this is global. You're looking at a potential downturn in the economy relative to the strength everyone was looking for. This is just another expression of financial cracks appearing in response to the fastest rate hike cycle since the 80s. We have to ask the question, are these central bank inflation targets too high? And I think the answer to that is, well, quite possibly, yes. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Let's get you to the weekend, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramwitz, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Your equity market on the S&P 500, positive 0.5%. Some of these <coughs> banks stumbling into the weekend, Tom. Western Alliance, PacWest and the pre-market. Just a little bit of a bounce. Yeah, more, and more than any time in ages, John, it is get to the weekend Friday. There's no question about that. Institutionally, the government has to get to the weekend. These smaller banks in defense. Maybe they're in defense of shorts. I think that's overplayed personally. But they got to get to the weekend. And what's more important is the American job economy's got to get to the, the weekend. I'm fascinated by the mystery around 185,000 non-farm payroll. We've got to get through payrolls first. And Tom is right. That is the number in our survey. The median estimate, 185,000. Lisa, that is down from the previous read of 236. That would be the lowest going back to 2020. But, and I will say but, because Tom actually raised a really good point yesterday. Less interesting to me than the headline number is uh, really I'm more interested in what happens with average hourly earnings. That to me holds the key to whether the Fed will feel the necessity to go in uh, and actually be more aggressive. And what's great about this is you see that in different banks, I mean, some of the major banks, they have different divisions. They have like this division, then they have asset management, they've got wealth management, da da da. Even there, there's some argument about what the Fed path is June and July and into August. And I think that shows we're right at that cusp. Rusciuto yesterday, John, was lights out. I believe you were on your sabbatical then. Steve Rusciuto of Missoula was lights out yesterday about the tipping point we're at. My sabbatical last 20 minutes, just for the record. <laughs> Mass came right. out with earnings a little bit earlier on. Big shipping company worldwide. They said yeah. the first quarter might be the best quarter of the year so far. German factory orders, incredibly volatile, I know. We've all got experience of looking at that data point, but still, Tom... Some of these things don't concern this, don't, con don't really correlate with this cyclical bounce that a lot of people are talking about, Lisa. It doesn't really stack up in a way that we thought it would post the new year, looking at China reopening and waiting for this bounce in global growth. This is the reason why it's so difficult to get through a week these days, because you're whipsawed by narratives. And the reality is it's a muddle. It's a, you know, basically a push and a pull. On one hand, you have oil prices, you have shipping, you have this consideration of a slowdown in the global economy. On the other hand, you have what otherwise looks resilient, which is a labor market and consumers that just keep on spending because that's what Americans do. Equities are up by 0.5%. We'll get to Apple and whether consumers are spending in just a moment. The broader market looks like this in a bond market yield. Just a little bit higher by a couple of basis points. 340 on a 10 year. I feel like you rehearsed that, Bramo. No, Looking I at Apple in the pre market. <laughs> Apple in the pre market, topping estimates. Another, what, $90 billion in buybacks? TK, <clears throat> that stock is up by 2.4%. You take $90 billion, you divide it by the diluted shares outstanding, and it comes out to a very ample ratio. It's a, Even for Apple with their mass, it's a jaw dropping uh, amount of share buyback. I put out a tweet yesterday, and just as one of the people that have stayed with Apple with all their innovation, Dan Ives at Wedbush. You know, and the, the basic story here is how many times have we heard Apple is so done, it's like over. And it's just, no, it's not. If you compare the numbers to the estimates, beats. If you compare the numbers over the last year, there's a lot of declining numbers there. Lisa, that we need to pay attention to. And a lot of reliance on the iPhone. Let's be honest. Oh, yeah, the huge. dominance of the oh, iPhone yeah. sales is really what's carrying them. It's not the Mac. It's not necessarily services, which is not gaining. So that's really an issue. I went through the three accounting statements and, and, and the rest of it. And, John, what I'd notice is, is everybody wants the fancy phone. That Where is it? It's over here somewhere. They want, they want this thing. They I, want this thing. And they're up near $1,000 per iPhone. That's ridiculous. All right. So we're going to talk about the iPhone and why you can pay for it. U.S. payrolls report coming out for the month of April, coming out at 8.30 a.m. Headline number, as you were saying, 185,000, John. And this is going to be probably the lowest going back to the depths of the pandemic. However, average hourly earnings are supposed to stay around 4.2 percent year over year increase. Still too hot for the Fed's liking. Today, Fed speak includes St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard at 12.45 p.m. Eastern, Fed Governor Lisa Cook at 1 p.m. Eastern. 
Tom, you can set your alarm because I'm sure you're going to really enjoy hearing that. And this weekend is Berkshire Hathaway's annual shareholder meeting in Omaha, Nebraska. Interesting to hear what he has to say about oil because they've really increased their share of oil stocks at a time when a lot of people are wondering what's going on, why oil is so low. I care about one thing, why they're not interested in the financial sector right now. Got a tease of that from Charlie Munger in the Financial Times in the last week. That's going to be the fascinating point for me, why they're not involved and sniffing around the regionals as they get cut in half in a single week. How worried are they about commercial real estate? What assets really are driving that concern? And at what level do they step in versus, no, this is not our gig, especially given their past rescue uh, plans? Steve Whiting joins us now, chief investment strategist and chief economist at City Global Wealth. Steve, wonderful to catch up with you. Payroll's out a little bit later this morning. Tom talked about the estimate 185,000. What are you and the team looking for today? Well, look, I can't quibble with the consensus here. Um, we are going to see, in all likelihood, a slowdown. If we take a look at what has happened with unemployment insurance claims, it suggests that not much has changed. Uh, but I would remember that back in January, suddenly we had a half million new, jo uh, half million new jobs in the month. Uh, and this is really because of seasonal distortions. And now we're supposedly going to be ramping up the hiring. So if there is a downward surprise, I think it's largely because of that, because this time of the year, all of the roaring things that happen in the housing sector and other areas are going to add the payrolls. Uh, but it may be short of that, just as January was an upward distortion. But that also tells you a lot about what's, what's important in the economy and how policy stimulus from past years is still delivering uh, job growth. But it's going to be different, in fact, even if we look at two years now. Steve, just how well supported is discretionary spending from the U.S. consumer at the moment? reasonably, but there's a lot of satisfied demand in goods. And we've seen post a January surge, you know, one of those other things that we question, um, it's done nothing but drop sequentially. Um, I'd say April auto sales uh, were in good shape. And this is an industry that really is bucking a cyclical trend. Uh, we didn't satisfy demand for autos. There was not sufficient production uh, during the COVID period. And so I don't think it has a real recession in that particular industry. But what's going on is pent up demand uh, for leisure hospitality. Uh, in the last 12 months, we've had one industry that's 10% of employment account for nearly 30% uh, of all job gains, right? And it's still below where we were in COVID. This is one of the reasons why just the rebound from COVID is still having effects on labor markets. Unfortunately, we can't count on that for the next one in two years. So, Steve, I get what you're saying about goods, and yet the reason why I was talking about how Americans love to spend is because I was actually uh, taking that directly from Kellogg's CEO, who on the earnings call said in all of their segments around the world, they see declines in consumer spending, except for the United States, where people keep spending despite some of the pessimism out there. So why are you moving away from U.S. equities at a time when the consumer is so resilient, even as elsewhere, perhaps there's more discretion? Uh, you know, blessed is he with low expectations. You know, we have uh, the world trading at less than 12 times expected earnings, the U.S. trading at over 19 times uh, expected earnings this year, uh, with probably downside risk across the world. So we've seen the U.S. dollar have a decade of gains through 2022. You can see that the U.S. has the most cyclical labor market in the world and the most cyclical monetary policy. So if we're not particularly bullish, and we aren't, we don't think there's going to be a horrible collapse in the world or the U.S., but we really think that the next few years we can have gains in currencies that are still quite weak, along with low valuations, we're going to start to gravitate to that, and we're going to do it for more yield, too. Wait, but this is actually a really good question, and John raised this yesterday, which is, if we do see some sort of downturn globally, does this mean that the dollar is not going to rally the way that it has traditionally? Probably not. Um, and I'd say the question about the downturn in the world, we're less convinced of that. You know, some of the things that happened, I mean, was, I think we, a big part of this has already come and gone, is when you think about the shock from the war uh, between Ukraine, Ukraine and Russia, uh, the hit that, that occurred, the terrible terms of trade shock for many energy importing uh, regions, Eurozone, UK, Japan, you saw currencies crushed last year, all time nominal lows. Uh, and as they've gotten through that, um, a good piece of their weakest economic growth was experienced last year already. And that's leading to some upward revisions. Uh, China, not everybody is confident that it's going to come roaring back, uh, but it's a lot better when it's not shut down. So the rest of the world is producing some subpar growth. 
It's the U.S. that has had all of this strength, a 3.5% unemployment rate. And uh, I, I would tell you, again, the effects of past stimulus are only waning. I think people who believe that uh, there's this really, really short policy lag, and we know everything about what's going to happen from all that tightening in the, in, in the last year, it hasn't been felt in the economy yet. So, so this is the reason why, again, the U.S. is settling down while the world is holding up a bit. Hi, Steve. Wonderful to get your perspective. Thank you, sir. Steve Wining there of City Global Wealth Management. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. Two names to focus on for the regionals, the banks. PAC West is positive by a little more than 12%. Western Alliance is up by a little more than 12% also. These banks have been hammered this week. <coughs> Through Thursday, the KBW Regional Bank Index is down more than 12%. Some phenomenal research, really interesting quotes out there too from the South Side. Tom, this from Cowan. Yes. We believe the banks are having their GameStop-like moment where social media is amplifying non-traditional approaches to assessing solvency. This creates a self-fulfilling prophecy that pressures stock prices, which then yeah. leads to more questions. The new evil short selling, it was out there yesterday with a vengeance. Um, I think there's a lot more going on here than just trading dynamics and shorting and, you know, where's the tick rule to help everybody out. But I will take the point, John, that the character of negativity on Wall Street is completely amplified by this modern technology. Well, Did you just see the Brahma move there? The air moved <laughs> in the studio here, folks. Listen, in our it's almost the weekend. Studio, the We're air trying moved. to get to the weekend. I have very, you know, loud body motions. But I do think that, look, this is something that was we saw really interestingly with the Financial Times yesterday, reporting that Western Alliance was looking for a buyer. Shares absolutely cratered. And then Western Alliance came out and said there's absolutely no truth to the story. You guys are just pawns of some short seller out there that's trying to uh, make bank. So this is sort of the level of tension and drama that's playing out in real time in public as well, people try to figure out what's going on here. It's get to the weekend Friday like I haven't seen John in ages. I mean, I, I just haven't. <laughs> I, I haven't, it's very I, distracting, isn't it? It, it is. What's great okay, about you know, you guys don't, I'll sit here totally. You don't see this out there. The Bramble no. Cam is not 10 <laughs> feet, but it's about eight and a half feet oh, off no. the ground over here. And we can show that. <laughs> it's very distracting. It is. Uh, Pre and Mr. <clears throat> TD so in the next hour on Bloomberg Surveillance. Looking forward to that. With equity futures on the S&P 500, positive 0.5%. It is Payrolls Friday and Coronation that. Saturday. And the number is 185K. <laughs> it keeps going. That is the estimate. This is Bloomberg. You could tell it's Friday. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Well, the U.S. jobs report may show the resilience of the labor market. April's report is expected to show that employers added 185,000 jobs and that the unemployment report ticked up 3.6 percent. That's only two-tenths of a percentage point off the 54-year-old record. And the jobs report due out at 8.30 a.m. New York time. U.S. regulators plan to make the biggest banks pay most of the bill when it comes to replenishing the government's deposit insurance fund. Bloomberg's learned that small lenders won't have to kick in extra money. The insurance fund was depleted by the failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. President Biden reportedly will name the Air Force's top general to become the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. That's according to the New York Times. General Charles Brown, the Air Force Chief of Staff, would become only the second black man to serve as chairman. Colin Powell was chairman under Presidents Clinton and George H.W. Bush. A free trade agreement between Australia and the U.K. will take effect May 31st. The Australian government says the deal will end tariffs on 99 percent of the country's exports to the U.K. It will also streamline visa and business licensing between the countries. And sales of Apple's iPhone rebounded last quarter. That helped the world's most valuable company beat earnings estimates. Sales actually fell 2.5 percent, but Apple warned had warned investors to expect a drop roughly twice as much. The results suggest that Apple is recovering from a slump that's plagued both the computer and smartphone industries. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. We need to change the limit on deposit insurance. The situation we have right now is we have effectively unlimited deposit insurance. Only the difference is that the billionaires who are taking advantage of it and the billionaire banks that are taking advantage of it 
are not paying for it. Senator Warren there making absolutely no sense at all at the I'm end of those comments. We, what does that even mean? You know, the whole heritage of this mean? program, folks, is when politicians talk, and we're trying to be as balanced as we can, John. I'll let you pick it up. But that was <laughs> that was baloney. I have to admit, I've loved the shift <clears throat> from politicians. I remember when they used to talk about millionaires, and then they became millionaires, so now it's billions. <laughs> They're trouble. They're trouble. Uh, I, I, th th there's headlines out now. I can't remember where I saw it, which paper. I'll let Lisa probably knows better than I do. The banks are, with a vengeance, going to pay for the new deposit oh. insurance Without a fees. doubt, one and two. Yeah. Let's explore the point she's making on unlimited deposit insurance. Take away the limit. Let's explore that a little bit more. So if you go to PacWest Western Alliance, Western Alliance will tell you that insured deposits represent over 74% of total deposits. You go to PacWest and they'll tell you that that number is something like 75%. You compare that to SVB where uninsured deposits were more than 90% of the deposit profile at SVB. So these two names, I think, Lisa, you'd be hard pushed to make, to reason that these two names are in trouble because of that and whether that change in the FDIC rule around this would actually do anything for them. Well, and let's be really honest, the billionaires that she's talking <clears throat> about are the big banks that they're going to put on the hook to pay for all of this, and those are the ones that absolutely had no problems whatsoever and actually had deposits come into their bank. So there's a question now um, at a time of who is <clears throat> she going after, given that a lot of the proposals aim to skirt some of the smaller banks in order I, to ask the uh, biggest banks to pay for it. It seems like Monday was two years ago, but I believe I tweeted out on Monday about the fifth bank of the United States, and ultimately that is what liberals and conservatives are arguing about, is the scope and scale, John, of this banking system. Should we talk to somebody who's an expert? Uh, please do, yeah, that would be great. Let's do that. On the second bank of the United States and the fifth bank of the United States, Chris Marinek is an expert. He's director of research. Jenny Montgomery Scott and has really been excellent for us. My theme on this Friday, Chris Marinek, is let's get to the weekend Friday. The banks have to get to the weekend. What should we see into Friday afternoon and this weekend from troubled banks with new book value uh, valuations that are shocking? Well, Tom, I think the reality is most of these banks just have security losses that are unrealized, and those are getting better as Treasury rates fall. I think you could see some action from the Fed or Treasury to reinstitute the TAG program from 2008 that was guaranteeing transaction accounts, that would be very helpful. I think most of these companies have much more stable deposit flows than anyone realizes. And that's been the challenge all week, is that we've had this temper tantrum against the Fed and using bank stocks as a weapon uh, against the Fed to try to get the Fed to change. Hey, Chris, well said. When you listen to some of the numbers coming out of the banks, they're telling you the deposits are stable. So when you hear people like Senator Warren say that we need changes to the limits for deposit insurance, does that actually change this story this week? Not really. I mean, I think it's good that she's supporting the, the changes in the limits, but I think the rest of the rhetoric is uh, correct, is incorrect. What do you think is going to be the circuit breaker, Chris, to really prevent this temper tantrum from rearing its head again as we talk about the otherwise resilient economy? Well, changing the short sale rule would help. I think also instituting, to some extent, going back to the TAG program would be helpful. I'd like to see the Fed change the stress test program to accelerate the timing. The stress test results were already filed in April, and the Fed has an army of folks that they could uh, stick out to put this out next week. It would be very useful to know that most of the banks, if not all the banks, have passed the stress test. The reality is, if you look at the next 18 to 24 months of cash flow that the banks have, it covers 500 to 600 points of loan losses, which is just as much as we had in the great financial crisis. I don't think those credit issues exist today, despite all of the worries on commercial real estate. If most banks really looked at their loan portfolio, did a uh, default loss given default analysis, you'll find that the credit marks and the credit losses are, are very moderate in the industry. I think we should recognize those and what they are and the ability for banks to absorb those losses with existing earnings and capital. And then we can reinstitute confidence back in the sector. You said short sellers uh, should be investigated. What do you make of the back and forth with Western Alliance in particular yesterday, with shares plunging after the Financial Times report and then them coming out and saying, this is just a tool of short selling? Is there validity to that? Do you think that people are going to exploit the jitters, the temper tantrum? Absolutely. I mean, we've seen stories that were rehashed from six weeks earlier on PacWest and again with Western Alliance. There was no news there. PacWest hired an advisor at the end of March, so that was completely <laughs> stale. I don't know why we continue to kind of create new narratives uh, just, to, just to help justify the positions. The facts are 
these banks have very good cash flow. They have deposits that are much more stable. Right. And really, liquidity has surged in the past two months. Chris, your note is blistering. You say the press reports are stale. Just for instance, I know a guy. He's a, he's, he's a guy that he's with the show uh, quite often through the week. He's going to sit with his barons open on Saturday and try to figure out which bank to buy. How do you select the good banks from the troubled banks on a Saturday morning as we've crashed? So we start with tangible book value, and then we apply the unrealized marks from HTM held to maturity portfolios. That's now disclosed in the FDIC call reports, and we've provided and so have some of our peers around the street. That gets you to adjust a tangible book. That's the first place to start. Then I think you look at the cash flow that banks have, the pre-tax, pre-provision, or what we call PPNR. It's the cornerstone of the Fed stress test. And then you apply that for the next uh, 12 to 24 months, and that gives you a loss absorption of the current loan portfolio. In addition to that, banks have got very well-disclosed uh, information on their loan loss allowances, on their credit marks, uh, and, per and particularly the amount of real estate that they have. Banks have been a wide-open kimono this time, which is massively different than what we saw in 2008 and Chris, what I hear from you is that the price action is divorced from the fundamentals, and I've heard that a lot from a lot of analysts on a lot of banks this week. The problem I think that a lot of other people have, though, Chris, is that the fundamentals will be shaped by the price action. So even if you think the price action is divorced from the fundamentals, the price action is going to shape the fundamentals, Chris. Does that not concern you? Well, I lived it through 2009. Fifth Third is my favorite example. It hit a dollar in late February 2009. They came back three months later and raised capital at $6. And then at the end of 2009, the stock was $14.60. So I've seen that happen uh, with many regional banks and all their other large companies as well. So I feel like that is the uh, 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 repeat event that is going on in my world. So I think we just have to have the confidence to move forward that the facts are that the banks have better credit quality, better cash flow than the investors understand. I realize that the bear case always sounds more intelligent, but it doesn't make it correct. So you think that these banks are viable with 5% interest rates for the rest of this year? Absolutely. It's difficult. It's not ideal, but they can make a spread. The spread will be narrower, but they can. And we think the deposit flows are much more stable than the market understands. Hey, Chris, wonderful to get your perspective. Thank you, sir. A constructive view from Chris Maranak there of Jenny Montgomery. Scott Tom on the regionals with PacWest this morning, up a little more than 12%. Western Alliance up around about 13 You know, our job is to drive this story forward. And, you know, his, he, he, Chris was really scathing about the press on this. I'm not going to go after the press on this. What I'm going to go after is we've done a deposit analysis. And this week, somehow, we got over to worrying about credit, markdown, what are bonds doing, what's real estate doing. And all this is fine. And people can decide buy, hold, sell. But we got to figure out this commercial real estate mess in America. That's not going to happen over a weekend. That's the next phase of it. Yeah. Isn't it? And, and I'm not sure how it's not a moon phase. It's like summer, you know, restructuring into autumn, maybe even into 2000. I've heard a lot of people say that this week, Lisa. You have as well. It was the rate shock. It was about deposits, all of that stuff. And it feels like this week morphed into something else, a focus on credit, credit risk. And the idea that the profitability story is really questioned. And even there, Chris was talking about how it's going to be very difficult in a 5% interest rate regime. Some might not be as good at it as others. So, yes, there might be the fifth thirds, but there might not be uh, some of those as well. And some of them may really struggle. The word that spooks everyone right now, strategic. The next one, <laughs> strategic options. options. You hear strategic options and you're like, ah, I'm Out. running to the hills, <laughs> running to the hills. Sarah House of Wells Fargo joining us shortly. It's Payrolls Friday. Payrolls Friday, and your estimate is 185,000. Two hours away from the payrolls report is the price action for you on the S&P 500, shaping up as follows. Keep it together, Bramo. You're going to blame me Keep for that together. one? No. We're positive 0.6% on the Nasdaq. We're also positive 0.6%. Four-day losing streak on the S&P 500 coming mm, into Friday. Longest that. losing yeah. streak since February and potentially the worst week since SVB failed back in early March on the S&P. Let's see if we can do something about that a little bit later. In the bond market, the two-year, what a range so far this week. The high 416 intraday, the low 365. 
the two-year right now, 382.70. We are up by three basis points, Tom, on a two-year this morning. Yeah, I looked at the data today. I really don't know what to make about it. You mentioned, you know, SPX down 4%. I'm looking at the 12-month trailing and Dow fractionally green, but everything else is slightly negative. And I just don't know what sticks out here, except, John, what you mentioned earlier in the week is the bond volatility just won't go away no. with the 382 two-year yield. I mean, we had I believe we had a 379 at one point yesterday. It's sticking. I don't do the FX check anymore. Bramo does that. <laughs> so let's get the euro up on the screen yeah. 110. If we can. 110. 110. 110. Yeah, 110. yeah, 110. It's still 110. What did Lagarde do yesterday, John? Yeah. You, watch, there you, we go. you watch Lagarde more than <laughs> I do. How did Lagarde do? This is not a pause. They are one and certainly not done, is the takeaway yeah. from the ECB. Big, I thought big the, pushback. The headlines we are not the were Federal Reserve. Better... We are not the Federal Reserve. Yeah, exactly. Seems yeah. to be the message from President And the Lagarde. headlines had more meat to them last yesterday than I've seen recently. She was very clear yeah. about that. There's more work yeah. to do. But I'm hearing a lot of people say the same thing about the ECB this morning, off the back of some soft data out of Germany. Can this cyclical, this relative cyclical boom that people are playing up, can that stick in Europe? Can that persist if the US starts to slow down? And what's that going to mean for so many people that are along this currency looking for that rate differential between Europe and the United States to close and maybe even see Europe break out. You know, honestly, at this point, people can convince me of any narrative they want because they can show me data that's going to support it. So I can hear the idea that they're going to actually see some sort of boom and invest, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But then the idea that they always follow the U.S. on a six to eight, nine month lag and they kind of started I, later. I kind of buy that, too. So, yep. you know, it's a tough one to parse out. I'm not going to give my opinion on this, but, but. I will say this <laughs> is you, here's the question for the weekend thinking. Is Europe more like Japan? Or is Europe more like America? There we go. That's the triangulation you got to think about. I'll spend the weekend thinking about that. You do that. Two hours away from the payroll report. Wall Street out with their forecast this morning. Goldman expecting the strongest job growth and Morgan Stanley the most bearish. Sarah House and the team at Wells Fargo somewhere in the middle looking for job growth to slow to 195. There's Goldman, Tom, up at 250. Yeah, Jan Hasse is lifting up here a couple of days ago at Goldman Sachs. Sarah House joining us right now, senior economist at Wells Fargo. Uh, Sarah, the idea of the run rate on non-farm payrolls is distant from where we are. How do you get from, let's say, a blended average sub 200,000 non-farm payrolls down to a supposed run rate, dare I say, of 120, 100, or even under 100,000? What's the timeline to get to normal real economy job growth? Well, I think if you're not talking a potential recessionary environment, the, the runway is still fairly long. So if you think about the, the typical run rate, uh, it's, it's higher during the expansionary phase. But I think as we see headwinds over the labor market continue to intensify, that I think we're, we're going to get there faster. So we're looking for job growth to slow, you know, probably to that 100,000 range here by, by the third quarter and potentially even turn negative by, by Q4. Socially, is it a white collar recession? We've seen the bottom decile, even bottom quintile do bang, you know, really quite good off of COVID and the pandemic. Is there a character to the slower job market that we're seeing that's upscale? I think it is skewed towards some more of those white collar position kind of headquart company headquarter positions. I think one of the areas we can see that is actually in terms of the average hourly earnings. So if you look at the total average hourly earnings, that's decelerated pretty sharply over the first quarter. So it was just 3.2 percent annualized in March. But if you look at the production and non-supervisory, so that's about 80 percent of employment. That's still running a, a noticeably higher. That was only that was up 4.2 percent annualized. And so I think you are seeing that that sliver of where the weakness is, where some of the earlier job cuts have been, it, it has skewed more towards those those white collar or you know more more professional jobs. Sarah, we started to get a sniff of rate cuts in July, maybe even at the next meeting yesterday. That was off the back of some of the price action. Mike Gape and a BFA rate cuts and an end to QT March next year. Morgan Stanley, Ellen Zetner, Q1 next year for the first rate cut. Sarah, where do you see the unemployment rate year end? How does that stack up with what the Federal Reserve is projecting? And what's your call ultimately for when this Fed starts to go in the other direction? 
Yeah, so we, we actually see a pretty similar unemployment rate by year end to the Fed. So we're looking at four and a half percent. But unlike the Fed, we see them actually cutting by the end of this year. So it's one thing I think to say, no, we're gonna we're gonna stand pat, we're gonna look through this. But when you see a one percentage point jump in the unemployment rate, so well above the, the threshold for what's considered that the economy is is in a recession, we think at that point the Fed's seen enough weakness coming down the pike that's gonna help further slow inflationary pressure that they do begin to cut later this year, probably most likely right now looking at, at that December meeting. Sarah, what would you have to see in the market? What would you have to see in the data, for example, what we see in two hours' time here with respect to the employment market to change your view that perhaps the unemployment rate isn't rising that quickly and things are more resilient and actually that rate cut wouldn't necessarily be needed? Yeah, so I think just looking at the continued resilience of, of job growth. So, you know, we've been expecting a slowdown for you know, really the, the past six months, and we've gotten it to some degree, but not nearly as fast as, you know, really all economists have expected, as indicated by the consensus continually undershooting what payrolls have actually printed. So I think that, that's a big part of it. Um, I think the wage dynamic is a different aspect of it. So, again, we saw you know, some tantalizing evidence of wage growth coming off the boil pretty sharply here with the average hourly earnings numbers, but that just wasn't corroborated with what we saw in the employment cost index, certainly not with what we saw in the unit labor costs. And so I think if you continue to see the labor market hang in there and point towards inflation taking even longer to come down, then I think that really changes some of the, the pricing dynamics and, and what and where the, the Fed cut estimates come in. We were just talking to Chris Marinek about some of the action in the regional banking stocks, and he said that it was a Fed temper tantrum, basically. People uh, reacting to this idea that there could be vulnerability and, oh boy, the Fed's still raising rates and how do we deal with this? Do you think that's going to be the last temper tantrum to emerge? Do you think that there are other temper tantrums that are waiting in other sectors of the market? Well, I think what we see is when the Fed tightens, you know, even if it's at a measured pace, like we saw in 2004 to 2006, you know, you can have later on, you can have some pretty ab abrupt shifts. So the impact of tightening doesn't all hit at once. And so that's why we're not necessarily looking for a completely linear slowdown in, in terms of, of job growth as we move through this year. But thus far, it's been what we would consider a, a pretty orderly slowdown. But that can that can shift as, as we move further into this, this tightening cycle and really the effects of what we've seen already take take hold. Sarah House, thank you of Wells Fargo. Sarah, thank you very much. Let's talk about the jobs market. This came from the CEO of IBM, speaking to Bloomberg earlier this week. Mr. Krishna. Being a people manager when you're remote is just tough because if you're managing people, you need to be able to see them once in a while. You know where this is going, don't you? Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be every minute and you don't need to be functioning under those old everybody's under my eye kind of rules. But at least sometimes... Tommy goes on to say, we encourage you to come in. We expect you to come in. We want you to come in. He wants you in three days a week. This is really important reporting by Matthew Boyle. Look for this story, folks. I'll get it out on Twitter here at some point. Arvin Krishna is trying to change the culture at IBM. Good luck with that. And I love in the in, John, this is important on Jobs Day. They cut 5,000, but in the first quarter they hired 7,000. And then he doesn't mince words on WFO. That's our phrase for 2024. We're all jaded by this, the three of us. I, I mean, this. you know, we're, we're, not <laughs> thinking, we're not thinking clearly about work from home. But there it is. It's a huge debate. Tom, we've talked about this a million times. You can solve this easily. Money. That's it. Simple. In my opinion, that will be the two- to three-year workout is all of a sudden commuting is going to be part of compensation. Pick how often you want them in the office. <clears throat> if you want them yeah. to live near the office then whoever does that gets paid X and whoever doesn't gets paid Y. If you want the luxury of living far away from the office yep, and coming in, in a couple camp. of times a yep. week, I'm then great, camp. you've probably got access to cheaper property markets too. Fill your boots. Brent Bramo is like maximum Bramo right well, now. I know, <laughs> you like guys are just picking on me today. Look, Bramo. you know, okay, I can't restrain myself, but this is not linear. It's not like suddenly we can all work remotely, and I think that's what IBM CEO is getting at. That there is a cultural <clears throat> uh, cultural loss to companies that go entirely work from home, and you end up having a really hard time bringing them into the fold. So if they don't work in the office, it's not simply you know looking at the cost. I, it's I, also I, looking at potential for leadership, looking at potential for understanding the culture. And if you take a look at what's going on now, 
there was a study that came out among U.S. employees who can work from home, nearly half of hybrid like, oh, arrangements, like, and just one in five in are fully remote with the rest in the office full time, which is notable. The middle child is scathing on this. She says it's a complete con job. People are working three, four hours a day. They're doing it off of lattes and, you know, yeah. croissant or whatever. What She's got all her friends are at, at cafes doing this. Oh, there's one word that and, kills me. And it, I'm sorry. That's what comes out of the mouth of the middle child. There's one word that kills me. Culture. That kills me. Tell that to the 5,000 people that got laid off that you just mentioned. Yeah. Coming for the yeah. culture. Well, OK. I'm if not... you want them to contribute to the culture, compensate them for that. It's as simple as that. If you believe there is value in their contribution to the culture... And yet they're part of this family. But then when they get laid off, it's like, it drives me nuts, the culture line does. It really does. I'm not, talking, really does. I'm not talking about how everybody is part of the family, kumbaya. But what I'm talking mm -hmm. about is having relationships with people that really make it worth coming in every day. I mean, there is a sense of idea building and sort of the spontaneity that gets built with all of that. It's the culture of interpersonal relationships, not necessarily the culture of complete... <laughs> <laughs> Not even you believe this clap trap. Honestly. <laughs> Can I just say on the meeting stuff? Please. And you pull yourself together because you know that was. Anyway, I My agree with you. My glasses are fogging I up. I agree with you, but if you believe there's value in it, then compensate people for it. Sure. That's the point we're at. I would That's agree. That's the point we're at. All roads lead back to money. Compensation and money. They do. They do. Bottom line. Bottom line. <laughs> I agree, but I think that it's important to also have a feeling of connection to what you do every day. I mean, honestly, how many people are just having lattes and don't have connections? What you're the middle asking, child's what you're asking scathing on this is racket. for senior management to come in and teach the kids. That's what this is really all about. It's about senior management coming in to teach the kids. That's it. Who was it that said that you can't really get promoted? If you don't come in, then it's really Krishna, hard. That's yeah, that was what the IBM's, yeah, yeah, yeah. IBM's alluded that. to. I mean, pick your career track. If you want yeah. to progress, put a suit on, come to work, and do your best. End of story. Be in the office five days <clears> a week. <throat> I'd be that guy. I know I am. I'd like th That's what I would do. Right. If, if you don't want that lifestyle, I'm not saying it's for everyone. No, but it's and you want to stay from home and live in a cheap suburb somewhere. I, John, and have the, the backyard and all the open space, you know... Great. John, the Australian sure, whatever. John, the Australian philosopher James Gorman said it best. You know what? If you're going out to dinner in Soho, you can come into work. Yes. He did say <laughs> That's that. Yeah. Simple. Well, it's true. <clears throat> the culture. Okay, all Kumbaya. right. <laughs> oh yeah. We're the a family, the culture. The court. Oh yeah. boy. Yeah. yeah. Right. Kumbaya. Yeah. And then we're laying off twenty percent. All right, okay. Like, have you ever sat there and laid off twenty percent of the family? I have to I have to get some water. Kids, this month it's tough, you're out. <laughs> Have some time. Good luck out there. Futures positive 0.6%. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> ah, Lisa. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word. I'm Lisa Mateo. In just a few hours from now, the Labor Department will issue its monthly employment report. Expectations are that payroll growth probably slowed in April with 185,000 jobs added and the unemployment rate ticked up slightly to 3.6% from historically low levels last month. President Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, heads to Saudi Arabia this weekend. It's a sign of the administration's push to smooth over rocky relations with the kingdom. Bloomberg's learned that among the people Sullivan will meet with is Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken will go to Saudi Arabia next month. BMW is the latest automaker to upgrade its recall of vehicles with the Takata airbags. It's telling owners of the 90,000 sedans and SUVs not to drive them until the defective equipment has been fixed. The recall covers older vehicles. The Takata airbags are blamed for at least 25 deaths in the U.S. Carl Icahn's Icon Enterprises issued a dividend to investors after coming under attack from short seller Hindenburg Research. And that sent the stock up by double digits after falling more than 40 percent since the release of the Hindenburg Report. Hindenburg claims that Icon Enterprises' value is inflated by 75 percent or more. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Apple generates a ton of free cash flow, and if you're not going to buy the stock, and Warren Buffett's not going to buy the stock, Apple's going to buy the stock. Tim Cook is an amazing uh, CEO, but he has a challenge here to the extent that he has to uh, broaden his supply chain and move out of China 
to, to some degree. Uh, the good news is that as he expands into India, he kind of has the footprint of what he did in China. Great to catch up with Tom Forde there, the senior research analyst at TA, DA Davidson off the back of these Apple numbers. Apple positive in the pre-market by a little more than 2%. Looking at the broader market, one hour and 44 minutes away from the payrolls report. Jobs Day in America, we're looking for a number of about 185. Some big names looking for a number bigger than that, though. Goldman looking for 250. Yeah. Sockgen, who have been really good at forecasting this number, Tom. Sockgen looking for 260. If I look at the standard error of non-farm payrolls, John, I got everybody sort of sliding into this board, and I'm wondering if we're set up for a shock here. I mean, I, no one's looking for, oh, Oops. Have you got a, a lean one way or the no, other? No, no, I don't. No, no, no I, I don't have any strong opinion either. I'm just not qualified to do the silly guesstimate on it, is how I'd put it. I just can't get there. Wages maybe will be interesting with unit labor costs where they were. Yeah. But I, it's going to be interesting. We'll get there at 830 uh, this morning. This is a joy right now on Apple because he is decidedly not a fanboy. Pierre Farragut was legendary at Sanford Bernstein and joins us now from New Street Research. And what I love about Pierre, folks, he's got a distance to him. He's not four miles from a latte shack in Cupertino or any island in Manhattan. Pierre, thank you so much uh, for joining us this morning. I want you to quantify the impact of a price for an iPhone approaching $1,000 because everybody wants the fancy iPhone 14 Pro this, Pro that. And I also want you to quantify that $1,000 because the wireless cell phone companies are helping out Apple. We're really not paying $1,000 for our phone, are we? Um, yeah, you know. If you had asked me that question five years ago, I would have told you no. Nobody would would buy would spend like a thousand dollars on an iPhone, and I would have told you, you know, this wireless company is paying for the iPhone. You pay them back with like outrageously, outrageously expensive uh, monthly monthly price plans, okay? And and, and I would have gotten that uh, completely wrong. Um, what Apple demonstrated is an extremely strong pricing power and ability to positively improve right. the quality of their products uh, and get you to pay that. Um, and what you see today is that, honestly, 2023 is a tough year if you sell smartphones. Everybody's suffering in this industry, Samsung, uh, cheap, cheap suppliers. And, and what we saw last night is that Apple, despite having like um, cranked up these prices so much, uh, is actually uh, seeing an iPhone business that is not doing great. You know, there, there is a lot of pressure. Demand is not very good. But on a relative basis, Apple is doing um, uh, impressively uh, well, all right, going through the storm relatively well. If we look at the income statement, I'm going to call you middle of the road here, not a fanboy, not an Uber bull on Apple. Is the durability of that pricing power the heart of the matter? Is that the future for Tim Cook and Cupertino? Well, I, I like the fact that you put me right, right in the middle because... There is one issue with pricing power. You don't get your average selling price going from $600 to $1,000. Uh, and then you can't play that trick one more time and again and again and again. So th that's the reason why today, you know, the future of Apple is, uh, is of course, to benefit from these very, very strong uh, unit prices and, and the scale they have today. But, but the future has to be elsewhere. Um, you, um, we are not like we don't think Apple can uh, step up pricing a second time, uh, and so th that's the reason why you know we, we, we're very much in the middle of the road and thinking yes, Apple is a uh, is a good business, but what's the growth potential of the earnings power of the business? now that the iPhone is at the $1,000. Uh, this is it, Pierre. This is such an important conversation. What's amazing about Apple, it's the most researched company on the planet, probably, them and maybe a handful of other ones, and yet still there is this debate about how to value it. What is it? Is it a growth company? You're pushing back against that. Is it a luxury company with fat margins? Maybe, although you're saying we're testing the limits of how far they can push, push pricing, so they're certainly not LVMH. Is it a staple? Pierre, what is it? What multiple should you put on this name? This is exactly uh, the conversation we're having with the team this morning. And it's a very, very difficult question. Um, if you look at Apple today, it's trading roughly between at the, between 30% and 50% premium on the S&P 500, right? So you pay 30 to 50% premium, 
to buy a business that is showing the resilience they're showing today. So you know that when things go wrong and are getting tougher for everybody, they're getting easier for Apple. Now, you're paying that premium on a business that cannot grow earnings more than 5 to 10% a year on a normalized basis. Even if you, if you are very, very constructive on Apple, um, you know, unless you get into scenarios of Apple doing a car, Apple like really changing the world with like a, an AR uh, headset, they can't really grow earnings more than five to ten percent. So, so what's um, you know why would you own the stock? You know, it's thirty to fifty percent more expensive because there is a quality premium, and then it compounds five to ten percent, um, uh, five to ten percent a year. Yes, maybe, but then it's not like a, it's not like a bad. Uh, a bad deal, I would say, a bad value proposition, a bad equity story, but it's not super, um, super compelling. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, John, the question is, could it be worth like 2x the S&P or something like that? And here, it's a whole debate of, if you look at the next quarter, the quarter the, the team is going to report in July, for $1 Apple makes with the iPhone, they're going to be making more than 50 cents uh, with services. And um, Tim said on the call yesterday night, they are approaching a billion subscribers uh, on their products. Um, and so that's where, you know, the premium you pay for, we know the compounding power of Apple cannot really, you know, um, escape gravity like this 5 to 10% oh. is a bit of what they have to live with. But the underlying quality of earnings and things like that is like, it's a difficult question. It's difficult to have like a firm answer. But Pierre, there is this sort of big uh, elephant in the room, which is the $90 billion of buybacks and the increase to 4% uh, dividends each quarter, given the fact that this is a company that can just afford to absolutely flush the, uh, the market with cash. How much does that basically push away all of these nice, neat math uh, and sort of valuation uh, arguments and really challenge the idea of a stock going down significantly from here, as your price target suggests? Le, yes, so, le, le, on, uh, le, so, so the, the price target you, you refer to is not calling for like the stock collapsing for where it is today. It's a, it's a price target that we uh, update once, uh, once a year and give, give an outlook. So if you put it into the perspective of when we, uh, when we updated it, it's, uh, it's actually a price target that tells you not, we don't expect much to happen on the, uh, uh, on the stock, to be honest. Uh, on you know the, the, the dividend, um, the buyback, uh, of course it's boosting um, how much like compounding uh, uh, compounding you can expect on the stock. But that's the thing, you know, as an investor, you're like, what's my total return? If the if earnings power, if free cash flow, if all these metrics revenues grow five to ten percent a year, that's a five to ten percent return. Okay, uh, if the company pays a dividend uh, that grows 4% a year, that means my dividend is following that return profile. So it's not additional value to me. And then how much is the dividend as a percentage of the value of the stock? What is the dividend yield? And you see that the dividend yield of Apple, because it's trading on a fairly high multiple, is in low single digits. So, so you're talking maybe you know 8 to 12% total return if you Look at how much you get with your dividend mm -hmm. and how much you get because the stock, because the company is growing. And so, as I said, middle of the road, it's not bad. I definitely don't think it's bad. Um, but so you don't have like a significant outperformance opportunity just out of this math. You, you need more than that, which would be the stock re-rates. It yeah. goes right. from a 30% premium to a 70% premium. Or Apple, you know, virtually almost reinvent itself again with with an AR uh, a headset or with a car or something like really, really new. Th these are the things that really would move the needle beyond an 8 to 12% return. Or we'll just spend more time on a call talking about AI, Tom. That usually they gets you about $10 they, uh, that's in, very the, cool in the pre-market. Like, that was wonderful. Pierre, was a... really thoughtful stuff. Thank yeah. you, sir. Pierre Faragou there of New Street Research. That stock is positive this morning, 2% well, in the pre-market. A different view. You've got Dan Ives in the 9 o'clock hour, yeah, and to he's going to reframe here. Everybody's catching up with Ives at $205 target, and I saw a lot of 190s, more enthusiastic than Pierre. Is it a growth night. company anymore? That's the conversation over at New Street. Coming up next, Priya Misra of TD. It's Payrolls Friday, Tom. <laughs>
The stars are also realigning here with the interest rates, with the banks, with the debt ceiling. The Fed is dealing not just with a domestic inflation problem, this is global. You're looking at a potential downturn in the economy relative to the strength everyone was looking for. This is just another expression of financial cracks appearing in response to the fastest rate hike cycle since the 80s. We have to ask the question, are these central bank inflation targets too high? And I think the answer to that is, well, quite possibly, yes. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. The payrolls report, 90 minutes away, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramwitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market positive by 0.6%. Up on a session, down on the week, the banks have been absolutely hammered. Tom, we're looking for a bounce here on PacWest and Western Alliance. PacWest right now in the pre-market, up by close to 18%. A bit on the banks, and I take your point, John. It's not just about payrolls today. Payrolls, to me, is a mystery. I think it's been under played. I like that Hotsius has moved up to 250,000 at Goldman Sachs, more enthusiastic, off an enthusiastic ADP. Guess what? Nobody cares. What we care about is our local bank. We care about these uh, banks in the news. And the reporting from Bloomberg Finance, I think, has been great as they heal, perhaps, and it's get to the weekend Friday. I mean, that's what these banks have to do. Before we can get to the weekend, we need to get to payrolls. Let's talk about the mystery of payrolls, Lisa. 185 the estimate this morning. And the expectation for wages to increase at about the same pace, about 0.3% month over month, which is still perhaps faster than the Fed would expect. People are talking about how they're not expecting a big market reaction from this. There is a big question about what's going to be the bigger surprise. And I wonder if the playbook for 2023 is have a bias, stick to it, repeat. I mean, that's basically, you can play your narrative out however you want. You can take whatever data points you want, and that's going to be the same thing today as we get payrolls. Well, let's be clear. The bond market traded on data once this week. It was Monday. Yeah. <laughs> we got the prices paid component of the ISM manufacturing. Rates went up, yields higher. OK, and then what was the rest of the week? The rest of the week was about financial stress in the regionals, dragging yields back down. So, Lisa, to your point, for many people who have got that rate cut call for later this summer, that's not about the data, is it? That's about something else. We've gotten data that has highlighted the stickiness of inflation. We've gotten the Fed that says we're not cutting into year end. And people say, yeah, you're cutting into year end. And yeah, there's still this incredible disinflationary force. So again, how much are we looking at the sort of stasis in markets, regardless of what we get today, uh, in about 90 minutes' time? Looking forward to that number in 88 minutes' time, oh, just to so... count you down. We've got a clock somewhere. There it is. <laughs> One hour, 27 minutes you're and fired up seconds. today. <laughs> Who are you talking to? Your equity market. <laughs> positive 0.6% on the S&P 500. In the bond market, yields are a little bit higher by three basis points, 340 on a 10-year. Lisa knows where the euro is. You all do. 110. Tom, 110.22. Yeah, 110.22, and we're, we're going to have to see uh, from that. I mean, I just... I, I just look at the data, and I guess I go back, as I did on Monday, to the two-year yield. What was it, 405, 410? 34. Whatever. We went to 379 right now, 3.82, and you look at that at 830. And then you follow the bank data, that's your Friday as you get to the weekend. Elisa reclaiming 70 as well on WTI. I want to watch in the oil market. Definitely, especially because that's been one that's been a mystery with people saying that the fundamentals also don't cohere with some of the weakness that we've seen in oil prices. 8.30 a.m., the latest data point that perhaps you can just dismiss, U.S. payrolls report for the month of April. It is important. It will give us a sense of where the labor market is, particularly with wages. If they come in around the same 0.3 percent month over month or a 4.2 percent year over year, we're not necessarily seeing a decline in terms of the pace of increases, and that will be present a challenge for the Fed. Today, Fed speak includes St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard at 12.45 p.m., Fed Governor Lisa Cook at 1 p.m. Unclear what they can say that will move markets. People still trying to parse out where the dissonance really lies, the dissent on the Fed that we really haven't seen in the voting. And this weekend, Berkshire Hathaway gets together in Omaha, Nebraska. They have a 5K, I believe, on Sunday, if you want to head out to Omaha and race in the 5K. Um, it's called the Festival, Annual Shareholder Festival. I was looking it up. But um, as you were pointing out... That, that sounds like a cult. <laughs> But, you know, what you're describing sounds like a cult. Take, check check it out. I've never been. I'm, I was looking at the at the website, and they have you know very colorful kinds of you know advertisements. Nice. Okay. It used to be valuable, and then it got, as John respectfully says, culty. Is that the right word? That's what it feels it got, like. Yeah. And to your point early in the last hour, folks, Lisa Bramwitz brought up this idea of Mr. Buffett and his team 
and hydrocarbons. Yep. And that's what I would take notes on this weekend. Well, all the Occidental missteps. petroleum and the rest. They said in 2008 they would never invest in oil. <clears throat> then they loaded the boat with oil, where they now have a higher concentration of oil investments Chevron going back Occidental. To, uh, to early 2000. And to your point, John, banks. Are they going to go oh, into yeah. the regionals, especially given the fact that traditionally they have been part of the rescues, and now they are raising concerns about commercial bank valuations, commercial mortgage valuations, and some of the assets on the The banks. sound of their silence has been deafening around this story. We got a tease, a preview maybe from Charlie Munger, the vice chair of Berkshire Hathaway. If you haven't seen that, look, in it, look for it in the FT from the last week or so. I thought it was some strong indication as to whether they're going to step in or not. I think that was a pretty strong read that they won't be anytime soon. Why would they if they're saying this is a huge canard and this is something that's problematic and that's going to have uh, longer lasting effects? Now they're going to say, OK, we're going to come in. I mean, a cynic would say they're trying to push down the valuations to get in at a better price point. But you know, I'm not a cynic. A you got to get the maximum brand. You're going to run a 5K, 5K at an investor meeting. I, Priya Misra <laughs> joins us now. Five, <laughs> three miles. I, just, can you imagine? It's anyway, like three and a half miles. head of global rate strategy at TD Securities. Priya, wonderful to catch up with you. Priya will not be going to that or running that 5K with them <laughs> anytime soon. Priya, good to see you, as always. Priya, let's talk about these numbers out later. Lisa's on the money, I think. Does this data matter to this bond market later on this morning? I don't think so. I think we're all watching banks. I do think that the reaction would be a bit asymmetric. So if you get a weaker number, I think the market's already on sort of uh, what we're calling a recession alert. So that recession alert starts to flash a lot uh, even more if, if, the, if the data is weaker. We're actually looking for slight downside surprise. We're looking for 150,000. But I would highlight mm. anything above 85, 90,000 is actually above trend. So I think it, it just tells you how difficult the situation is for the Fed and the market that's uh -huh. hoping for some Fed relief I, I think here for, a, for a quick Fed cut. That's not happening. Priya, people are shell-shocked when you look at a three-month, 10-year spread and the other spreads that are out two, three, four standard deviations. I mean, it's an unusual time. Where does the 10-year settle out 12 months from now when we de-shock? So I think 12 months from now is actually almost an easier call than the next three months, because I think 12 months from now, a lot of the lags from monetary policy, as, as well as the lags from credit conditions that we know are tightening as we speak, um, I think they start to play out. 12 months from now, we think the Fed is aggressively cutting rates, because even if inflation is above 2%, right. it would be much lower than where it is right now. You're not but giving me a number. Months... Priya, give me a number here. Are we going under 3%? Is that the, is that the news of May of this year? We are. Yes, we are. I actually think we could get there by the end of this year. You're asking 12 months from now. Yeah, I think we're looking at 250, 275 wow. with a Fed that's that's cutting aggressively. Priya, I want to go back to this idea that the data doesn't matter at a time when people basically are saying we haven't seen the effects of everything. And so we just have to wait for a bit. What are you looking at then in the meantime to get ahead of that? Is it just simply the senior loan officer survey or do we just find out from uh, from the Fed chair that it's not going to matter and it's just going to confirm what we've already seen? I think we will be watching at the details of, of, of the senior loan officer survey and also what's the end game for the banks. Right now, there's a game of chicken here between the larger mm -hmm. banks that want to wait for the FDIC to take a loss, the smaller banks that keep getting sort of lower in, in terms of valuation. What's the end game? Do, you know, does the FDIC put forth this unlimited deposit insurance? Does it keep getting worse? Is this a slow burn? We're actually thinking this is somewhat like the savings and loan crisis where banks just continue to fail. And that's going to tighten lending standards as we speak. So as, as much as, uh, uh, you know, uh, the SLU's report is going to be important, we'll be watching for how worse, how, how much worse is it going to get. So I'm watching that. I'm also watching what's happening on QT. I think it's the, you know, the least appreciated form of tightening. So as long as the Fed is doing QT, which they're telling us they're going to keep doing, deposits keep leaving the banking system. Now, they're also leaving the banking system uh, for money market funds, but they're being extinguished by the Fed. Does the Fed do anything with QT? I'm not very hopeful that they will. So, you know, I'm watching um, sort of Fed response, what's happening with the banks and uh, sort of real rates. As long as real rates are well north of 1%, which they are, or I would say even 50 basis points, that, that means policy is restrictive. Policy is restrictive. We still have to see the lags play through. That's why, uh, you know, our conviction on the slowdown just continues to get stronger. I hope that there's an end game really quickly for the banks. But if there isn't, I think we have to reassess how much the Fed's going to have to cut next year. Not this year. I think they're going to be very reluctant to cut rates. But when it's clear that the unemployment rate is rising very fast, we're getting close to 5%. 
I think, uh, you know, at that point, we have to reassess the Fed's going to cut a lot. Priya, I'm interested in your interpretation of Chairman Powell this week, and it's different for everybody. Did you get the impression that he was saying there is reason to be calm because there is reason to be calm around the financials? Or did you get the sense that he's saying that because he's got no choice but to say that? I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, it's not a cop-out answer, but essentially they're trying to buy time. You know, it's not up to the Fed to solve the banking problem. They did what they could do. Uh, you know, they provide a discount window. They've got BTFP, but they cannot solve the, the capital problem. That's something the other private sector banks have to do. That's something the FDIC has to do. I actually think we need a TARP-like system from Congress. So what the Fed's trying to do is say, you know what, balls in somebody else's court. All we can do is provide liquidity and buy time. So I think he was trying to keep all options open, you know, suggest a pause. But if the data remains strong, if the banks start to stabilize, I think the Fed can potentially even hike further. So he was just wow. highly non-committal in, uh, in our view. Pray, are you not of the opinion then that this regional banking system is struggling with 5% interest rates? They are, but is the Fed's job to help the banking system right now? I would say, you know, this idea that they can separate monetary policy from financial stability, I actually highly disagree with that. The way monetary policy works into the economy is through the banking system. So some of this tightening is the intended consequence of tightening. This is now for the private sector and for the government to figure out what happens with the regional banks. I think the Fed has a very clear mandate from Congress, which is the, the labor market as well as inflation. So I think they can pause. They're not going to want to cut soon. And I think because they'll be late to start to cut, they're going to have to cut a lot more. But yeah, I think, um, you know, as much as I think the what will really help the banks is if the Fed starts to cut rates significantly. I don't think that's the reaction function of the Fed right now, given the economic data we're, we're living with. Inflation still at five. Priya, thank you. Priya Misra of TD Securities on this bond market. Tom, with more conviction there about the slowdown that's around the corner. Absolute tour de force that you just heard there, folks, on a time frame of three months. In her time frame out 12 months, can you imagine these banks and the salvation they feel with a price up, yield down, bond recovery, a disinversion, if you will? The conversation continues next hour. Nadia Lovell of UBS on the equity market. Equities right now positive 0.6%. On Payrolls Friday, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The U.S. jobs report may show the resilience of the labor market. April's report is expected to show that employers added 185,000 jobs and that the unemployment report ticked up 3.6 percent. That's only two tenths of a percentage point off the 54 year old record. The jobs report out at 8.30 New York time. U.S. regulators plan to make the biggest banks pay most of the bill when it comes to replenishing the government's deposit insurance fund. Bloomberg's learned that small lenders won't have to kick in extra money. The insurance fund was depleted by the failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. President Biden reportedly will name the Air Force's top general to become the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. That's according to the New York Times. General Charles Brown, the Air Force Chief of Staff, would become only the second black man to serve as chairman. Colin Powell was chairman under Presidents Clinton and George H.W. Bush. Sales of Apple's iPhone rebounded last quarter. That's helped the world's most valuable company beat earnings estimates. Sales actually fell 2.5 percent, but Apple had warned investors to expect a drop of roughly twice as much. The results suggest that Apple's recovering from a slump that's plagued both the computer and smartphone industries. And there's a sign that the electric vehicle price war in China may be taking its toll. Shipments from the Tesla factory in Shanghai fell almost 15 percent from March to April. Tesla triggered a slew of discounts and incentives offerings from other car makers when it slashed the prices of its Chinese made EVs at the start of the year. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. We need to change the limit on deposit insurance. The situation we have right now is we have effectively unlimited deposit insurance. Only the difference is that the billionaires who are taking advantage of it and the billionaire banks that are taking advantage of it 
are not paying for. I swear the control room's winding me up, playing that again. Set it a warrant. I have no idea what that was about. Do you? Can you translate the I last do. bit? It was What's about the last bit mean? The, 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 the. I, I'm advocating for you, common person. That's all OK. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. But did it make sense? No, not right, from any okay. policy perspective. Look, this, right. Where this is going, let's assume that the bank thing, as Priya Misra just said, continues on and, you know, it's a slow motion thing, whatever anybody's theme is. We're going to end up with seven guys standing up with Jane Frazier with their arms up in the air in, you know, it's going to be a photo opportunity in front of Congress. Then what? And what are they going to do? You know, they're going to they're going to pass what? Certain maybe deposit insurance. You know, they'll do something there, I get. But when she's talking then, about the billionaires who are taking advantage of it and the billionaire banks that are taking advantage of it and not paying for it, what does that mean? I, I have no idea other than she's conflating the marketing plan uh, to give Mark Zuckerberg a 1% or 2% mortgage as a billionaire with what's going to actually happen with the big banks on Park Avenue. They're going to pay a ton of fees. PNC in Pittsburgh is going to pay a ton of fees, et cetera because of this banking tobacco. The past couple of months has made the political narrative very complicated around the banks because it's been very popular to bash the biggest banks as being uh, too big to fail, of being sources of stress. And in this latest banking crisis, they have stepped up and they've been stable. So then how do they go after them at a time when, at least from a political standpoint, and say that they were the bad actors? And then who do they go after? The regional banks that have the votes for a lot of the constituents. I mean, this is really some of the calculus politically that makes <laughs> yes. it very difficult to understand what, what the policy is. Have you is. noticed that anything they don't like these days, you just put billionaire in front of it, and it's like billionaire banks. Like, just pick <laughs> anything you don't like and just put billionaire in front of it. It just sounds so much worse. <laughs> I'm here for you. We're after the billionaire whatever, you know. It's meaningless stuff. It's just ultimately well, meaningless stuff. A little much more honest, and of course we will cover this on Balance of Power, starring Anne-Marie Hordern and a cast of characters, Joe Matthew, Kaylee Lines there last night, I believe. Our Bloomberg Washington correspondent Anne-Marie Hordern with us uh, this morning. Anne-Marie, I about fell over in the Washington Post this morning as <laughs> Governor Reynolds of Iowa is going to drag us back to the child labor laws before I was moving bags of oats around in an Amway a million years ago. I was thunderstruck by the language of Iowa to get 14-year-old kids in, quote, construction and demolition. What in God's name is going on in Washington and our states on this jobs day over kids 14, 15, 16 having real jobs like that? Well, this isn't actually a debate at the moment in Washington. This is taking place at the state legislature in Iowa, and there's been some fierce debate about it. You have critics coming out and saying, as you say, this is bringing us back to a time this is unsafe. But others are saying, actually, this is good for uh, accessibility for the individuals in their teens to get access to the labor market and can potentially work till 9 p.m. and there's other provisions like that. But I think what you're hinting at, Tom, given the fact that it is Jobs Day, is right. that what we are seeing in a lot of states is they are, are struggling at times uh, with this tight labor market for certain jobs, especially as we see more manufacturing right. plans, given what you have with the Chips right. Act, given you have the Inflation Reduction Act, coming back to America. I mean, Lisa, it's, I'm going to quote this verbatim or I'm going to get in trouble. This is verbatim uh, to my editors. It also bars workers younger than 18 from working in, quote, establishments where nude or topless dancing is performed, unquote. I've never seen a story like this ever on labor on this Labor Day. This is, like, like Anne-Marie said, I believe this is not a Washington discussion, but this is what's going on in the middle of America. What are we talking about? Why did that strike your uh, interest so much, Tom? Because we spent, we spent what, 200 years trying to get labor laws uh, across a broad swath of America? John, help me here with England. Oh, I mean, I'm not helping. had kids in the coal mines. <laughs> you keep digging. Oh, come on. In England, you had kids in the coal mines. Like, what are you talking about? And, 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 do, you, do you want the elephant in the room, the number? Yeah. Unemployment in Iowa is 2.8 percent. Yeah, exactly. 2.8%. Thank you. Well done. Well, OK, so this goes to the labor market report, Anne-Marie, that we're getting out. Not necessarily children working in topless establishments, but I am wondering whether uh, this is going to be a good thing or a bad thing for this administration it must be if we get, uh, tell me about it, if we get a bigger than expected number. In other words, what is Washington hoping for with respect to the labor report? How are they going to spin it after it comes out? 
Listen, what you see this administration constantly do is find the one great part of the labor report, and they say, or usually it's the fleet in CPI days as well when it comes to inflation, and they spin that forward. So obviously, if it is a low unemployment number, they will say that they have um, added X, Y, Z number of jobs. They have this, you know, pre-pandemic record low unemployment, and that is because of the Joe Biden economic agenda. If there is slowing of the labor market, and we do see uh, the unemployment rate tick higher, not lower, the administration will come out and say, well, we need to be seeing this. We want to see a controlled slowdown in the economy to make sure that what the Fed has been doing is working, and that's to get inflation low. So either way, you're going to get a spin. Is anyone planning any legislation down in Washington with regards to the banks? Is the White House promoting any legislation that should be pass through Congress at all. Amory, the comments that I heard from Corinne Jean-Pierre yesterday, they were a classic. I think we turned it into a promo here on Bloomberg Surveillance. <coughs> said something like, we're monitoring developments in regional banks. <coughs> They're monitoring it. It's just like meaningless stuff. You know, that <laughs> Bremer, they go, into these, they go into these press conferences. You know what happens. They take that big book and someone asks about the regional banks and they flip through it and they get to page whatever it's on and it says, we're monitoring the situation with regional banks. Amory, what on earth does that mean? That means that they do not want to speak about the banks, but they have to have something to say, so they are, quote, unquote, monitoring it. No, but in all seriousness, there are people at the White House who would be monitoring the banks, the likes of Lyle Brainerd, the head of the National Economic Council, the likes of Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Obviously, they are looking at what's going on. What they are doing in terms of the concerns around the regional banks is any chance they can get, they are talking about more regulation. And they really point back to the rollback of these Dodd-Frank laws, uh, which, again, were passed in a bipartisan way under the Trump administration. But what they're saying is that Congress should be doing more and there should be more regulation. We hear from the Republicans in Congress is that the regulation is already there. The supervisors just weren't using it. AMH, thank you. Amber down in Washington, D.C., Bramo with the lean. Well, I okay. Can, see it. Go can on. I just give a public service announcement sure. to politicians, just in general, that when they say certain phrases, John is on a tear to point out how meaningless they often are as they sure. go out. And, you know, I love this. It's sort of an existential week for you. You've gotten to the point where you're just like, it's all meaningless. I've, I've, I've Why? Had enough. It means nothing. I know. They, well, it okay, look, nothing. a lot of things mean it. nothing. But people are trying to parse through a nuance, and it doesn't play in politics. I keep going back to that. They can't be like, well, we think it's okay. We're not sure. We're really concerned. Well, what I care about is policy. What I hate is politics. What I care about is policy. And when you start talking about the regulation and the rollback under the Trump administration, supported by some Democrats in Congress, by the way, which often doesn't come up when the White House talks about this, when they do that, great, that makes sense for a long-term approach to the financial system. I think we're all on board. That's something we should discuss. But in the immediate run in front of us now, we need to talk about, OK, do we understand how they've diagnosed the problem? How does the White House see the problem in the regional banks right now? Is it something that needs to be addressed with... FDIC deposit insurance changes to that, in which case then we should be pushing Congress to do something there. Is it because interest rates are too high? What is going on there? Because at the moment you've got bank failure after bank failure in the United States of America. I'm not convinced that I've got any idea what they actually think about it other than that they are monitoring it. Well, and it goes to Priya's point, right, when you asked her this question, for is Jay Powell basically saying everything is fine because he wants to imbue the market with confidence or because he actually thinks it's fine? She said both. Well, how much is that policymakers, too? We're getting a handle on it, are they? Do we have a sense that they have any clearer notion of it? We just don't know. And so at what point do you sacrifice, you know, the idea of pushing the markets for credibility? Equity futures right now, positive 0.7%. Payrolls one hour and about four minutes away. Someone messaged me about a month ago, six weeks ago, and said, John and Lisa are on air talking really fast. It must be serious. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm, I'm not sure this morning is serious. Do you remember that message? You it got was, that too. Yeah, if it's yeah, Sunday yeah, yeah. night and John and Lisa are on the TV. Speaking quickly. Speaking quickly, you know there's it, things that get serious. Yeah, it must be serious. Yeah. It must be really serious. Okay, anyway. <laughs> your equity market looks like this. That was just mumbling. Not fast, don't worry. Well, uh, 0.75% on the S&P 500. On the NASDAQ, up by around about the same amount. We're down on the week through Thursday. Four-day losing streak on the S&P 500. The longest losing streak going back to February. If we close the way we were on Thursday at the close, it would be the worst week on the S&P 500 since the week the SVB failed, ending March 10th. The regional is bouncing back, the small caps too, the Russell up by more than one full percentage point. Outside of that, the likes of Apple doing okay in the pre-market, up 2.8%. They beat estimates after the close yesterday. We'll talk about that name a little bit later. In the bond market, big range on the two-year this week, through 4.16% at one point on the two-year really early this high. week. And then we got down as low as 365. We've come back to about 382.29, Tom, on a two-year this morning, up three basis points. What you did with that great data check is the idea the bond market is nuts, to borrow a phrase from Angry, Angry Beavers, and the equity market, SPX, is at 4,100. If you told me the bond market you just verbaled, I would say 3,800 on SPX in a heartbeat. Or not. The post-SVB low on a two-year, 355. So we weren't too far off that level in the last couple of days. I will say this, though, about the equity market. Banks failed in March. The S&P 500 was up on the month. We had the prospect of a bank failing in April, went into May with that. The stock market ran it in April too. So there you go. It's been pretty resilient. And that trading range still sticks. 3,800 to 4,200. Still sticks. Year to date so far. Outside of that, let's get to the foreign exchange market. Just to wrap it up for Lisa. In the FX market, the euro at 110 against the US dollar. 110, 21 Lisa and basically unchanged thanks. on the session. Wow, that's cool. Anytime. And thanks, I appreciate that. By the way, talking about stability, Apple, we should say, up about 2.5% in pre-market trading after their earnings yesterday. And how much is that the entire story of stability in the index, right? That is what we're talking about is a tech rebound, not necessarily what we saw in some of the underlying stocks. So Apple shares up uh, 2 and 3 quarters of a percent, 2.75%. With people just seeing that iPhone behemoth just continuing to mint cash, I do want to give you a sense of the banking rebound that we're seeing today. PacWest, Western Alliance, and Metropolitan Bank Holding all up, led by PacWest, shares up nearly 20%. The why here, I really don't know, but a lot of people are pointing to the report out of the Fed yesterday that talked about a decline in some of those emergency windows, although I do think a lot of that is attached to First Republic being taken out of those estimates. So what can we actually glean from that? It's sort of like pick your narrative and tale of roulette and that's sort of where we're seeing this whipsaw action go. I also want to just point some of the other shares that really have been uh, reacting to earnings. Carvana, remember that was like the zombie left for dead because who's going to buy their car online when you could do that from all the other dealers as well. Those shares up almost 40% after saying they're going to return to profitability. Of course their shares were up to, you know, 250, $270 uh, a couple of years ago. So still uh, that's pretty it's pretty far down from where we were. Also seeing DoorDash up almost 4 percent people are still getting their salads delivered to them and paying premium for it and lift and this is a story we keep talking about in terms of consolidation of market share lift shares plummeting uh, almost 16 percent after showing that they're kind of really struggling to compete with uber it's just really tough but they're not uber it's that simple isn't it it's that simple and this is a tough market. And so how much do we continue to see consolidation of market share? Lift down a little more than 15%. We are about 60 minutes, a little bit less than that, away from the jobs report in America. Ray Farris of Credit Suisse and a team expecting payroll growth to slow to 190,000, saying this. Broader labor data point to some deceleration in job gains and the composition of recent payroll releases, Tom, suggests that employment growth in the most cyclical sectors, manufacturing, construction, is rolling over. A view from Credit Suisse and, very importantly, a view from a different economist. Ray Ferris is chief economist at Credit Suisse for the Americas, but far more with important tours of duty on the Pacific Rim, which gives him a different uh, perspective. We'll get to the Pacific Rim in a moment, Ray. Let's talk about the American labor economy. I'm told the run rate is 100,000 non-farm payrolls, maybe 120, maybe 85. I'll let you tell me. But the answer is we're distant from that this morning, right? Even whatever the number is this morning, we still have a buoyant labor economy. Absolutely. I mean, we, we have a forecast of 190. Since the ADP numbers came out, I'd have to bias that to be over 200. The, the thing to do here is to kind of get pre-pan on you, right? You know, think about where we were in December of 2019. We had an unemployment rate of 3.5%. The six-month average for payrolls 
at a time when the economy was clearly growing, nobody was talking about recession, it was all good, 167,000 a month. And we're about to, with an unemployment rate of 3.5%, we're about to print sort of 200 plus. This is the Godot recession. You know, it's just, we're still waiting for it. And the problem that the Fed has is not recession. The problem the Fed has is there's just too much growth. So what do you see in the cyclical sectors right now that was mentioned in your note? Is there any sign whatsoever that the interest rate increases for the last 12 months are starting to bite in some way, shape or form? Absolutely. So what's beginning to happen is that the good sector is beginning to soften. Housing is beginning to bite into elements of employment there, you know, in real estate, in construction, especially in finished carpentry and those types of things. But the fact is, for this level of GDP, the economy is running at least a million jobs short. And that million jobs short is in the services sector. It's in healthcare. It's in travel and entertainment. And it's, interestingly, in local government. So there's some degree of rollover in, you know, goods and construction, but we're still going to add jobs in those services sectors. And that's the Fed's problem. It's not even so much the average hourly earnings, the wage growth. It's just simply that we keep printing lots of jobs. People have got jobs, they got money, they go out and they spend. So if you say this is the Godot recession, and basically it hasn't gotten here, hasn't gotten here, <clears throat> inflation's still hot, at what point do you just revise the outlook entirely and say, okay, we're not going to necessarily get any sort of downturn, rate cuts completely off the table, and this is one that we can actually see an economy that chugs along for quite a bit of time? Well, the economy is slowing. You know, we were 3% growth in the third quarter, 26 in the fourth quarter, 1.1 in the first we're going to probably go down sub one for most of the rest of the year. The, the Fed's, I, I think markets are overpricing the likelihood that the Fed's going to cut rates by the end of the year. I think they're just too optimistic about that. Um, you can't have a bust if you haven't had a boom. And the credit sensitive parts of the economy, thinking about you know, getting a credit crunch of sorts, the credit sensitive parts of the economy are business equipment spending, re- structures, both residential and commercial. Um, And if you look at those things, well, business equipment spending is 7% below trend. Everybody talks about commercial real estate. Non-business structures investment is 16% below its Mm pre-pandemic average. And residential construction is 6% below its trend. And we got a shortage of houses. You on the high ground on the Pacific Rim and the China analysis from a U.S. perspective with your foreign exchange work at Credit Suisse over the years, do you believe in a 6% or, dare I say, even 5% China GDP? Can they get it done and persist with that kind of GDP? They can definitely have a 55 6% year coming off of a couple of can really bad years. It? No. Growth is probably going to slow back down to, if they're lucky, in 2024 high fours. The problem China has is it now has a policy environment, a political environment, that really is a major constraint on the private sector. And crucially for the the global economy, for us, for Europe, that recovery is very insular. It's all about domestic services. You know, you're seeing this recovery in growth, but a fall in imports. So it's not having any meaningful spillovers that are boosting global growth. Are they leaning towards Chinese brands? What are you noticing there about the nature of that domestic recovery, that domestic services boom? Well, it's, it's all about going back out to restaurants. It's about travel, and it's focused domestically. Remember also that you know, China didn't have – it had bouts of lockdowns, but it never really had a big shutdown of its manufacturing complex. So you know, manufacturing is not actually below trend. Consumption of goods is not actually below trend. What's below trend is consumption of domestic services. And that just doesn't use a whole lot of copper. It doesn't import a lot of capital goods. Doesn't spill over. Ray Farris of Credit Suisse. Ray Smart, as always. Thank you, buddy. We are about 50 minutes away, 51 minutes away from the payrolls report. Coming up at 8.30 to break that down. Jeff Rosenberg of BlackRock reacting to those numbers. Looking forward to that conversation. Fantastic lineup in the next hour. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance looking for a number of 185,000. That is the median estimate in a survey that we conduct monthly. 185, Tom, is the number. That's down from 236, the previous read. Let's go over payroll 101. The standard error on this is huge. If you have a number of, pick a round number, 200,000, 
what's the gap where you can say, well, I didn't get it right, but I was within the error, and the, we forget. Wait for, wait for the revisions. Help me, Ray. One divided by the square root of n. Is it something <laughs> like that? Am I close? Whatever it is, the standard error is a Ray, Ray Ferris football field wide. So at 8.30, should we just ignore it, TK? A lot of pros do, but they do go beneath the headline data, which we'll do here on Bloomberg Surveillance. The pros may, but the market usually does move somewhat. And I do think the more that I start to look at what everyone is saying in terms of pick your bias, stick with it, what do you think an upside surprise would do to this assumption that Fed hikes are well, working? Well, the hotsiest number, 250,000 away from Ray Ferris and the others. That's the question. It will reinforce this idea that monetary policy is in conflict with financial stability because they're going to have to hike interest rates too much if you have to keep on pushing out that call for higher unemployment. Do people then capitulate on rate cuts by the end of the year? Or do they say, well, no, because that financial stability piece will come into play? I mean, really, it is sort of, you know, people can make the argument to confirm their narrative, and it's convincing either way. I, I give it to them. As you've mentioned and we've talked about through this morning, these cuts are priced in for later this summer. Slowly that's happening. It built up yesterday because of financial stress in the regionals, and it has absolutely nothing to do with the economic data, does it? No, and then there's this question of, okay, well, was it idiosyncratic? <laughs> Each and every bank, idiosyncratic. I mean, if, I can, if I can chime in. You can. I've got 20 seconds. You've go got 20 for seconds. The, the, go. The, the way to think about those rate cuts by your end is their fire insurance. They're basically the market saying the direction is something's going to blow up or could blow up. And if it blows up, the Fed's going to cut 300. So we got to have some fire insurance in there. I hear you. You're not the only one saying it. I've heard that a few times that either we've priced in too much or not enough. There's kind of like no in between. If they need to cut you know, this year, it's because they need to go big. Ray just cut it like Elarian does. I mean, he was well, on the edge of Mahalo sure. there. I mean, you know, just excuse me, I got one more thing to say. There's a show to anchor Ray in about an hour and 20 minutes if you want <laughs> I don't really mind. In the equity market on the S&P, positive 0.7% on the S&P 500. Payrolls, 48 minutes away. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Well, just like Jonathan said, in just under an hour from now, the Labor Department will issue its monthly employment report. Expectations that payroll growth probably slowed in April with 185,000 jobs added and the unemployment rate picked up slightly to 3.6 percent from historically low levels last month. President Biden's national security advisor Jake Sullivan heads to Saudi Arabia this weekend. It's a sign of the administration's push to smooth over rocky relations with the kingdom. Bloomberg's learned that among the people Sullivan will meet with is Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken will go to Saudi Arabia next month. In other news this morning, in Serbia, President Aleksandr Vucic promised that there would be significantly tighter gun restrictions after two mass shootings this week. Now, Vucic also announced a buyout of weapons in what he called a disarmament. A school massacre in Belgrade and a shooting rampage outside the city left at least 17 dead and 21 wounded. The UK is preparing for its first coronation in 70 years. King Charles III will formally accept St. Edward's crown during a service Saturday at Westminster Abbey. The coronation is expected to be a gift from the country's pubs and restaurants. Still, because it also includes a national holiday on Monday, there's speculation the whole thing could lead to a slight drag on GDP in May. And the parent of British Airways in Iberia raised its full year earnings outlook after reporting a surprise profit in the first quarter. IAG highlighted how the airline industry has bounced back from the worst pandemic slump. The company has benefited from lower fuel prices. Meanwhile, demand has driven up airfares faster than inflation. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. generates a ton of free cash flow and if you're not going to buy the stock and Warren Buffett's not going to buy the stock Apple's going to buy the stock. Tim Cook is an amazing uh, CEO but he has a challenge here to the extent that he has to uh, broaden his supply chain and move out of China to, to some degree. Uh, the good news is that as he expands into India he kind of has the footprint of what he did in China Tom Forde there, the senior research analyst at D.A. Davidson. Live from New York with Apple up in the pre-market going into payrolls. 
about 44 minutes from now, your equity market just about positive as well on the S&P. The regional banks, which were in trouble yesterday, doing better this morning, up 20% on PacWest. Western Alliance up more than 15%. And this line <coughs> just coming through from Andrew Holland, Horse of City, who said on Monday... We hypothesised that the resolution of First Republic would draw a line under the period of deposit concerns and refocus markets on macroeconomics developments. We were wrong, at least in part. Deposits have been stable since late March and banks have not, in aggregate, sought out new emergency liquidity from the Fed. The most recent movements in bank equity prices are more about general confidence than deposits. Tom, that would be a more difficult issue for regulators to address. It's a, it's a difference in deposits, and I've noticed, I would say Wednesday, it's, it's been such an exhausting week, John, I'm not even sure which day to quote, but I'm going to say on Wednesday there was a flip from deposit dynamics, yes, but now we're over looking at normal marking bonds and credit dynamics as well. And then you even go over, you take it further and say, no, Tom, it's not about credit dynamics. It's just about this crazy bond pricing that we see within a basic bond uh, data check. You can pick your medicine there, or maybe it's all three. As we go to Priya Mesra's statement, we're going to see this extend out. So as we identify the issues, Tom, and you've done a great job of just going through many of them there, on deposits, it puts them in a tough spot because every time they come out and talk about them and say things are okay, it doesn't really make a difference. Western Alliance okay. have said basically the same thing Pac West have said. The bank has not experienced unusual deposit flows following the sale of First Republic. That was Western Alliance. Pac West, the bank has not experienced out of the ordinary deposit flows following the sale of First Republic. To the two of you, if we get, I'm looking at BTMM on the Bloomberg, no one's framing a 6% money market fund, or 5.8%, dare I say. Let's not be inflammatory. But can we, you know, before we get to pre miserable sub-3% 10-year yield a year out, do we move higher in yield, moving those deposits ever more towards the highest rate? To put the two ideas together, on one hand, deposits might be relatively stable at some of these banks now. But on the other, there has been this drip, drip, drip of deposits out of banks, raising questions about the profitability and viability of some of the models that really grew up in an era of zero rates. And I think that is the challenge at a time where $588 billion has gone into money market funds over the past 10 weeks. That <clears throat> compares to $500 billion after Lehman's collapse. So that is just sort of the apples to apples comparison. This versus uh, and, and via uh, Michael Hartman at Bank of America. On a sleepy Friday afternoon after the surveillance snap, we get more data today. I believe there's more bank data coming. Bank lending out. data. Bank, yeah. Lend yeah. bank lending data. Yeah, more data. Look, today. you've got to work out what the underlying issue is. Is it just about deposits? It's other things too, but let's go with deposits and then work out, is it fear or is it greed? Is it fear because you're worried about return of capital? So you're taking your money to another financial institution? Or is it ultimately greed? It's about return on capital. And to your point, Lisa, you're putting it in a money market fund, rates are at four, five and maybe higher. Who knows where this is going? And they can't keep that money in-house because they can't offer that money on those deposits. The problem with the banking model is that there is a very narrow line that's very hard to distinguish between fear and greed. This question of they live and they die on reputation, on their ability to lend and their ability to profit from that. If that goes away and people lose confidence and they restrict the number of loans they start to extend, then that really tightens the credit conditions and it becomes yeah. more of a credit issue. Well, it's important for policy. That's why I raised the distinction between the two things. If it is fear, then you can address it with a new FDIC limit, right? Because then you know your money is safe. If it is greed and it's just about returns, it doesn't matter what the limit is. I'm just going to the place which offers me the biggest returns. And some of these regional banks, Tom, can't offer that. It's more complex. I think Senator Warren's quotes to Bloomberg here in the last 24 hours talks about the greed that's out there. It's always there. It's always present. Uh, Michael Spence's 2010 essay on this was textbook. The greed never goes away. The fear never goes away. Also never going away is Anurag Rana, our senior technology analyst, truly expert on the cloud and from the cloud with Bloomberg Intelligence expert on innovation. And Arag, I don't want you to do a sell-side walkthrough on Apple. I want to talk about Clay Christensen disruption, innovation, and the absolute sweat of new products at Apple with the legacy you and I remember from the massive failure of Lisa and Newton, not Lisa Bramowitz. This is Lisa the computer years ago. Are they setting themselves up for a flop? No, I don't think any of these companies are setting up steps on the, for a flop. At the end of the day, these companies have massive amount of data. They have a lot of engineers re, you know, going through it. And in each and every way, you see some of those AI-enabled applications show up. 
you know, whether that's in pictures, whether that's in voice command, whether when you're writing an email, um, these companies are really working hard to make sure that your next level of products are far more intuitive than the earlier ones. What is a mixed reality headset? Is Mark Gurman called you up, our Apple expert, and said, well, I mean, am I going to be looking around, you know, like Lisa does when she's maximum Bramo? Am I, Anurag, am I going to be looking around with my that's mixed reality like. headset? I, I, I don't think so. I don't think that's a game changer from, uh, I would say, a product point of view. You know, it's like an additive product like, a, like an AirPod, uh, but AirPods at a very high attach rate. But from a mixed reality, we don't think it's going to be financially that big. But, but frankly speaking, it's going to truly open a new universe of applications, a new ecosystem by itself that over time, I would say over a 10-year period, will actually generate good amount of cash flow, services, revenue, um, you know, for Apple. Anurag, is it a good thing or a bad thing that the iPhone really still is the bedrock of the entirety of Apple's business model? I don't think it's bad. I mean, it, you know, to be very honest, I look back and I think of Apple more like Coca-Cola, that it's a very, very U.S.-based company that's going all over the world, spreading its best product. And, you know, iPhone is the linchpin. Now, with the other products, as I said, watch. I don't own a watch, but I do own an AirPod. So when you look at an AirPod, you have a very high, high attach rate. But maybe down the road, if the watch has some more health features, other things, I may go get a watch. So it's, if you are in the ecosystem, you're going to buy, uh, you know, products that surround that ecosystem. Anurag, what did you make of the emphasis on India and shifting to India as they continue to manufacturing the watches and the phones? Yeah, you know, it happens when you come back from India, you talk about India for several weeks. I do that quite often. So, you know, Tim Cook talked about it a lot. But <laughs> frankly speaking, it it, it generates, uh, you know, less than 3 or 4% of revenue from India. Um, it's a massive opportunity. I mean, from a, on, a, on, a, on a population size of it, you know, 90% of the current install base in India, they don't even qualify to for an Apple product. The Apple's market share is less than 5%. So as the middle class becomes more rich, they are bound to get the more expensive products. Now, you know, LVMH, Mercedes-Benz, all those products are doing very well in India. And over time, I think Apple's going to do very well there too. Anurag, is this a growth company anymore? It depends on what you think about it. I mean, this is such a, you know, safe haven for people. When the banks are blowing up, you really don't want to go on the weekend, you know, worried about what's going to happen on Monday. When you have a company like Apple, you're not going to be worried about it. Even, you know, this year it's going to grow somewhere around 3 to 4% in constant currency. Next year, the new iPhone comes in, that growth bounces back to 8 to 10%. 8 to 10% plus about 3 to 4% from buybacks, you know, 12 to 15% in EPS growth is not shabby for any large company. You don't see that, you know, very often, frankly. Anurag, wonderful to get your perspective. You know that. You're one of the best. Anurag Rana there of Bloomberg Intelligence on Apple. Apple in the pre-market at the moment, positive. Positive through the whole of this morning. We're up by 2.6%. Biggest weighting, of course, on some of these major indexes here in the United States. On the S&P 500, Tom, futures positive 0.7% oh. as we count you down to payrolls. And we count down to there. We also count down to, Na uh, to Naples waking up this morning. John, explain to us worldwide the Apple videos we saw last night. Oh, so of cool. monstrous celebration uh, in Naples, Italy. They've come close a couple of times over the last 10 years, but finally, for the first time, I think in about 33 years, you've got to go back to the 89-90 season. Is when this Diego, like the Lester one? Diego ago? Maradona was a god at this football yeah. club and still is in this city, even after his passing. Just amazing to see nope. him win the title. Terrible defence from my <clears throat> beloved AC Milan. Did not really stand up and try and defend this title at all. They're doing really badly in the league, I think, relative to what <laughs> well, they should But be. probably... <laughs> if I can go on that right another day. <laughs> no, no, but, but, John, this is important. And, folks, I need to get a flavor of Italian football. And the only way to do this is next Perfect. Wednesday, AC Milan, Inter Milan. I mean, that, that's a derby. I'm very excited. You have to remember, Tom, that I, my family's from the south and I ended up supporting the club from the north. But I, I understand the romance of a team from the south winning the, the Italian league and getting one over the Milan clubs and, and Juventus as well. There this we is go. really, really meaningful stuff to the city of Naples. Yeah. Congratulations, Thank Napoli. Just absolutely fantastic. Your payrolls report, 34 minutes away. Nadia Lovell of UBS, the former Federal Reserve Governor Randy Krosner, Jeff Rosenberg of BlackRock with us to break some of this down. Looking forward to doing that in the next hour. We are going to have more stress exhibited across the markets in the coming months. We have all the ingredients 
for a new growth scare. And I think equities, certainly in the short term, are probably a bit complacent to that. We are expecting a version of credit tightening and crunch to come through. We think still that liquidity is the big issue. My big fear is that we're already starting to turn from an interest rate risk story to a credit risk story. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keen. On a Friday, we're going to step away from the banking crisis, the news here of better pricing for banks. In this hour, the labor economy of the United States of America. John, we're near full employed. You mentioned Iowa earlier, under 3% unemployment rate. 2.8. It's pretty phenomenal, isn't yeah. it? For the country at the moment, the number is 3.5. We're looking for that to come up to 3.6. In our survey, at least, that's the estimate. 29 minutes away from that number. 185 is the headline estimate in our survey at the moment, 185,000. I have to tell you, though, for this bond market, Where's it's not the, the data number? that's pushed around this bond market. It's the bank stocks that have pushed around this Treasury market. Yes, yes. That's been the story yeah. for the broader market. Pac West, Western Alliance, names we would never talk about a couple of years ago. They've been kicking around that two-year and rate cut right. expectations for the last couple of days. And they're kicking around to keep on that theme here, 3.83%. We'll do the data check here in a moment. But to the whisper number of what we're going to see here in 29 minutes, 28 minutes, John, is the whisper number of Goldman Sachs and others nudging up a little bit off ADP, where they really don't have confidence in ADP. So on Monday... This market was kicked around by data, and it was the prices paid component of the ISM non-manufacturing, or rather ISM yeah. manufacturing number on Monday that moved this market together with a bunch of debt issuance as well. If you get a sign of price pressure from wages, which I think, Lisa, is what you're leaning into, right, in about 28 minutes, that could be the thing that reignites the conversation around sticky inflation again. Otherwise, are we just looking at what everyone says is a snooze fest, even though it's not really, because it's giving you some actual real information? This is the data for the data dependency that you've uh, talked about <clears> some <throat> this week. How much are we looking at data that people are ignoring to pick the narrative that they want to pick? I mean, really, again, I keep going back to this because I'm old enough to remember six months ago when we were talking about the most important Fed meeting, the most important jobs report. No one's talking like that anymore. Everyone's like, eh, it's well, not going to matter. I'm going to take the side of the optimist it. here. Neil Dodd, James Glassman at J.P. Morgan, hugely optimistic on the resiliency of American consumer. And the, and, and the answer here, John, is the Fed is demanding what? A 4% unemployment rate? 4.2% unemployment Four rate? Four and a half is that projection. And we're quoting Iowa. I've seen, I think Arkansas, when we had Congressman Hill on, is the same idea, sub 3%. I'm sorry, it's a fully employed America. What will it take to get unemployment higher? The projection is four and a half. They also think it's going to stay around that level for the next couple of yes. years. And a lot of people have doubts about that happening, right. Tom. I have trouble with this. I'm with Senator Warren on this. Why are we battling to have unemployment higher? I'm sorry. It, it, po po American politics is if I'm elected a free beer and I'll give you a job. That's the history back 200 years. And Tom, the fact years. that this conversation is so tense with <clears throat> unemployment at 3.5, you yeah. can only imagine what that would look like once unemployment starts climbing in a material way. I mean, that's what we're going to see here. We're going to give you all that data. Michael McKee's in Washington, right? Help He's me with DC. that. Yeah. Yes. Data, I'm going to go to the two-year, which I mentioned, John, 3.83%. All over the place so far this week. Through 4%, high of the week, 4.16%, the low, 365, somewhere in between at the moment at 383. On a 10-year at the moment, yields are a little bit higher, back through 340. Unchanged on the euro, euro dollar 110.12, and the equity market's on with the lift, up by 0 0.75% percent supported by the beast yeah. of this apple apple up by 2.6 percent in the pre-market i'll give you the apple move but i'm sorry 4100 folks spx here is a stunning number given the bond ballet uh, that we've seen to get us started here on this job say with all of our good coverage and please stay where this nadia level leads off senior u.s equity strategist at ubs global how separate is the equity market nadia from the bond market as we go to the jobs report you know, I think that the uh, equity market has a fair amount of optimism priced in, and a lot of that has to do with the larger companies that are really powering this index, as you have alluded to. Um, I think that in terms of the Titan Credit London said that these companies are more directly insulated. But, you know, we still remain cautious on the outlook for the equity market. We think that some of the market internals, including the um, flows data, all send in some bearish signal and suggests that some of the systematic buying that we have been seeing in this market and the short cover and support just isn't there anymore. And you have valuations that are extended earnest optimisms that are 
uh, more than fully priced in with an 18 times forward P. So we just think that this market remains fragile and vulnerable. And we're looking for another 5% or so pullback from here. And Nadia, historically, do you buy or sell the last hike? Historically, what you do is buy the last hike because normally you will see the market rallies rally from there. But I think that this time might be different. Like the, the setup is just different. You have inflation that are still high. You have now concerns within the banking system and some fragility around there. And so we think that the outcome is just going to be just, uh, just different this time. We think that the economy is going to slow uh, and that's going to pressure earnings. Do you care about this labor market report that we're about to get? <laughs> um Yes, we care if it's negative, um, but it's likely to come in in line with expectations or even surprise to the upside, as we've seen all this time. Uh, we think that it's just less of a focus right now. The focus is going to be, as we know, next week on the senior loan officer survey, which actually we've been talking about for months. Uh, but we're also next week going to be closely watching the small business, the NFIB small business surveys, because we want to get an indication of what small businesses are experiencing. We know that they are the ones that you're seeing the, uh, the larger labor demand and are they seeing any slowdown in sort of the expectations going forward. So is this about the fear that has been really imbued in the banking market? Is this basically this concept that there is this pernicious credit tightening that we just don't see yet that has a lag effect that's going to drive all action in upcoming months and everything that you've seen until now could be potentially a head fake? Is that basically your thesis? You know, our thesis is like we've been pointing to out um, tightened credit lending standards for quite some time as to why we had expected negative earnings growth this year because there's such a strong correlation. So we think that there's going to be further tightening. Um, you know, reality is like the banking system is safe and sound for depositors, but there still might be some concerns and uh, around profitability. We think that it's not safe and sound for profitability investors, and you're going to see the banks pull back and hurt for cash, and that's going to lead to lower loan growth and therefore um, probably a slower economic uh, demand going forward. Uh, so, Nadia, you wouldn't buy the banks right now? No, we are still uh, underweight on banks. We have been underweight for quite some time. We just think that you're having this negative feedback loop within the system right now. You have the shorts pressing, um, stock prices are falling. That's leading to confidence being shaken and additional outflows. But it's more about uh, more than about um, uh, outflows, deposit outflows. It's also about just higher deposit costs. It's also about like low loan growth and capital returns. So you have the earnings risk, the cyclical risk. But, you know, John, I would say that doesn't mean that, you know, it's not investable. We just think that it's still too early. And we do think that you want to focus on the higher quality banks that have higher uh, CET1 capital ratios that are already account and mark to market. Some of those available for uh, uh, um, sales securities. What is the headline that you would need to see across the Bloomberg terminal, a policy shift, if you will, that would encourage you to buy some of these names? In terms of banks, I think what you want to see, you want to see in terms of, you know, private private, private market really sets step up and also some um, deals that are not federally assisted. You know, you've seen all the deals so far in the last three banks have been uh, as a result of receivership and better deals. And so you want to start to see that not happen. You also want to see probably more an explicit guarantee of deposit to help cause some stabilization within the system. Always really thoughtful. Nadia, thank you. Nadia Lovell there of UBS Global Wealth Management going into the jobs number. 22 minutes from now, Tom, 21 minutes away. And as Lisa mentioned, you know, snooze fest maybe is a little harsh, but you're there. You're right. It, it, we've just sort of slipped into it with all the exhausting distractions of the week, including, frankly, the Fed show. And, you know, I, I, I look at this and, and I just <laughs> I just got to say, are we setting ourselves up? Remember, remember when we came out, it's going to be 100 and blah, 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 200, yeah, yeah. blah, blah. It came out yeah. half a million. I think that's an, I think that's an impression of me. <laughs> I think that's an you know. impression of me. All right, carry on. Yes. What was no, I, I, I just think I, I, I don't have any guesstimate here on what we're going to see other than maybe it's time for a big surprise. Well, to me, it's interesting that traders really didn't respond that much to a Fed meeting. They're not expecting I to agree. respond or, that much. Or the press conference. Or, or the press conference. Yeah. They're not expecting to respond particularly <clears throat> to this labor market report. Literally everything is hinging on the senior loan officer opinion survey that comes out next week. And to me, this really highlights the fear of banking stress overcoming everything else. Okay. Haven't we got a strong indication of what that's going to look like yes, already? which is also not going to necessarily move markets. So where are we? Mm. Where are we? Can we digress? Please do, yeah. It's an emotional moment. Not here. that you need anyone's permission. Team, team <laughs> surveillance. John, Lisa, and I were tearing up over 
the celebration of our team and a wonderful child. Well-mannered, pre-tuition. Preschool in Manhattan well, is 20,400. No what, we're doing. what <laughs> are we doing? It no is a either. birthday. Pineapple is one. And here okay. we are this morning. We say congratulations to Rachel and all celebrating that pineapple is one today. I don't know what you want me to say. $20,400 for preschool tuition in Manhattan. Okay. <laughs> is I that didn't actually, pay $20,400. Is pineapple actually that baby's name? Yeah, pineapple's her name. Yeah, why, 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 why it was a hell of a Harvey <laughs> Wallbanger. Why do I think he's getting us into trouble he's, here? Her, her name is, is not Lisa, pineapple. it's not pineapple. 20400 okay. for preschool tuition. That is insane. Is, is that it? how much it costs? That's what it costs at a fancy that's, Manhattan school, which insane. is pineapple's destined. I mean, you know, that's nuts. There's, no, there's no other way. We well, should of share it. what you're about to do, you know, in the future. Oh no, like, it's no, better I, if we no, don't I share. Don't. It. This is important. No, people say is this rehearsed? You, you set this stuff up in the control okay, room. The control no room one never asks, tells us, and no one knows this and, is happening. And just to be clear, Tom, no one asks whether this is rehearsed. I think it's quite clear no that everybody knows that it's not. No, that was what we did right from the start with Ken Pruitt, and you know, back with David Gore. Bring up the photo of pineapple. Apple again as we go to Jobs Day. I mean, I mean, you know, I, I mean. Was this we were going with youth employment? I just got a message from a Bloomberg subscriber. Take that dang tang away from it. <laughs> how that reads. <laughs> and a happy birthday to anyone celebrating a birthday right now. Yeah. Like a pineapple. Coming up, the former Fed Governor Randy Crows. Now your pay rolls report. Twenty minutes away. We all want to know what's in that tang. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Well, a few minutes from now, the U.S. jobs report may show the resilience of the labor market. April's report is expected to show that employers added 185,000 jobs and that the unemployment report picked up 3.6 percent. That's only two tenths of a percentage point off the 54 year old record. The jobs report, of course, like we said, coming up just under 15 minutes from now. Stay tuned. U.S. regulators plan to make the biggest banks pay most of the bill when it comes to replenishing the government's deposit insurance fund. Now, Bloomberg's learned that small lenders won't have to kick in extra money. The insurance fund was depleted by the failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. President Biden reportedly will name the Air Force's top general to become the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. That's according to the New York Times. And General Charles Brown, the Air Force Chief of Staff, would become the only the second black man to serve as chairman. Colin Powell was chairman under Presidents Clinton and George H.W. Bush. The co-founder of Oak Tree Capital, Howard Marks, reportedly will undergo surgery for throat cancer. According to the Financial Times, Mark wrote to his investors that the type of cancer he has is curable and he hopes to return to work around midsummer. Oak Tree had about $172 billion of assets under management at the end of March. And Warner Brothers Discovery reported a, a surprise profit in streaming TV, but the panel of HBO and CNN saw its legacy cable networks continue to lose advertising and viewers. The company will relaunch its streaming service as Max on May 23rd. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. If you get a weaker number, I think the market's already on sort of a, what we're calling a recession alert. So that recession alert starts to flash a lot uh, even more if, if, the, if the data is weaker. But I would highlight anything above 85, 90,000 is actually above trend. So I think it, it just tells you how difficult the situation is for the Fed and the market that's hoping for some Fed relief here for a, for a quick Fed cut. That's not happening. Priya Misra. Fantastic. Always is. Joining us from TD in the last hour. Looking ahead to payrolls. Payrolls about 14 minutes away. Looking for a number that might look something like this. 185,000 is the median estimate in our survey for the month of April. The previous month was 236,000. Coming into it, here's the price action for you on the S&P 500. We've been positive all morning. We're positive by 0.7% on the S&P. Helped out, no doubt, by Apple. Apple is positive in early trading by 2.4%. In the bond market, 
market yields just a little bit higher by three basis points on a two year 382 on a 10 year up two basis points to just short of 340 at 339 tom very good it is a different jobs day we are all colored by some form of banking battle crisis however you want to phrase it and as we do at Bloomberg Surveillance, we try to bring you people measured and deeply experienced. Today, we do something different on Jobs Day. Joining us, truly the nation's expert on regulation, he is Randall Krosner out of Brown, an incredibly distinguished uh, resume of thinking about our banking system, finance, into our overall economics. He is at the Booth School, Chicago, and a former Fed governor. Randy, I've been dying to talk to you about this. I I don't want to do the historical, is it 08 or that? How do we extricate ourselves from a mess which was based on the rate of change of interest rates instituted by Jerome Powell? So I think we've got to look really carefully at what's going on at the individual bank balance sheets. Um, some of these issues have been really obviously there. There are even some um, medium-sized banks that touted how brilliant they were by buying long-term securities and that allowed them to earn a little bit extra and even raise dividends. Well, some of those have not, not, not survived and not done so well uh, going forward. So I think that's really the, the, the next step. Uh, the immediate next step is looking very carefully where the issues are and also really just identifying the, the ones that are vulnerable and the ones that are not. Right now, there seems to be a lot of uh, spreading of, uh, of, uh, of concerns across a lot of institutions, some of which are stronger, some of which are weaker. Focus on the ones that are weak, deal with those, and then move on. Should we allow for combinations of 4,000 banks? Is this enough of a shock to finally, once and for all, move us away from the, not paranoia, but the debate wrapped around Andrew Jackson? <laughs> so, uh, you know, until relatively recently, we had 15,000 banks, then we came down to, to 5,000 banks. And the U.S. is really an outlier in having that many banks yes. relative to the size of the economy. Now, the small and medium-sized banks do something different than the, uh, the large banks. A lot of the local uh, commercial real estate lending, the big banks don't seem to have much of an appetite for that and uh, don't seem to be too eager to get into that. So I think there is value in having some variety across the types of institutions. Do we need exactly 5,000? I'm not so sure about that. Randy, we're about 10 minutes away from the latest uh, labor market report, and we're talking about banks, and that's really telling at a time when a lot of people are trying to look past this number and just figure out what the lending sentiment is, what the credit impulse is across uh, this nation. From your vantage point, do you think that that is dangerous to sort of discount the strength in the labor market for potential sentiment in the banking sector? I think it's important to be uh, very much aware of what's going, going on, because those you know, the, the 4,900 of the 5,000 banks that, that we have are very important for small and medium-sized business, and uh, a lot of jobs uh, are generated there. So I think there's a, a close link between the two. Uh, but obviously, the jobs report is going to be extraordinarily important for thinking about where the Fed is going to be going. Although I, I think it's highly unlikely that the Fed is going to be cutting unless there's some sort of crisis that, uh, that occurs. Uh, but it is going to tell you um, something about uh, the likely path of inflation and of where the Fed's going. What's the crisis that would cause some sort of response like that? What's the level of crisis, especially if this labor market is as strong as it's expected to be? Well, I think uh, the, um, uh, the tumult could come from uh, some different uh, different sources. One could be geopolitical. My goodness, we're in a really difficult uh, geopolitical world right now, whether it's Ukraine, whether it is um, uh, China, whether it's the Middle East um, or, or Africa. I mean. Uh, either cold wars, hot wars, or wars that might be uh, uh, be building up even further. So I think that's one one worry uh, that uh, mm -hmm. that could come. And obviously, there's uh, if there's a major financial turmoil, the Fed will respond. But it has to be, I think, pretty right. major. It's not just a couple of banks here and there. Obviously, the Fed was willing to raise rates despite the the tumult over the last couple of months. And so, just something like what we're seeing now is not going to be enough to get the Fed to move. Randy, you are the distillate from George Stigler, on, Frank Knight, I can even say, to George Stigler <laughs> and on to what Stigler did, which was the capture of the system in regulation. Senator Warren is fired up. James Dimon is a pinata as he takes out uh, bankrupt banks, essentially, and all. Have the rich guys captured the system as George Stigler studied? 
Uh, well, that's is something that we debate very much here at University of Chicago on exactly uh, how to apply George's, uh, George's insights. And so um, I, I think, obviously, um, uh, special interests do play a role, but also um, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. Um, we also see that it was uh, the least cost resolution for J.P. Morgan Chase to take over, uh, uh, take over First Republic, and the the, the Federal Deposit Insurance uh, Corporation Improvement Act of 1991 requires that the FDIC take the lowest cost uh, uh, take the lowest cost bid. They really had no choice in that, and J.P. Morgan Chase was able to make the the lowest cost bid. So there are pluses and there are minuses. Um, I think we do need to, to think about how we want to reshape the system going forward. Uh, and that might mean not just changing regulation, but also changing some of the, the, the laws uh, that would be up to, to Congress and for Senator Warren to, uh, to potentially change. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the programme. We are about seven minutes away from the payrolls report. The estimate, 185 this morning, 185,000. Lucky to have Randy Krosner with us. He'll be with us as we break down the number in about seven minutes' time as well. Mike McKee's down in Washington, D.C. He'll give you all the numbers you need when this number rolls out. Mike McKee, here's a question for you. When was the last time that payrolls came in below estimates? Uh, but uh, 13 months ago, actually, <laughs> in, in March uh, of, uh, of 2022, which coincidentally was when the Fed started it, raising its uh, interest rates. But uh, it has been a very long string. We'll see if that continues today, if it does. And actually, the whisper number in the markets is 190, so Wall Street is leaning towards another uh, beat that way. Uh, if it does, it may uh, put paid to the idea that we're going to see a rate cut in July to get to the Fed's forecast for unemployment of 4.4% by the end of the year. We're going to have to start seeing some big negative numbers in job right. creation soon. If not, uh, that's not going to happen. Mike, very quickly here, how did ADP and claims adjust the whisper and the guesstimates of this moment? Well, maybe uh, ADP has influenced the whisper number, hasn't influenced too much the overall number. Uh, some people did recalibrate their forecast, but for the most part, We've been in the 180 to 185 camp for a couple of weeks in terms of economic forecasts. Uh, people looking for a slight deceleration in job growth. We'll see if we get it. Mike McKee, thank you. Of course, Mike McKee knew the answer to that. It was the March jobs report released in April. We were looking for 490,000 and we got 431. They were the days, weren't they? Yeah, I mean, Lots of numbers like that. That was the last well, time I... that payrolls came in below estimates on the day. Isn't that phenomenal? It's phenomenal that people have underestimated this economy to such a degree and that now people are saying that actually, even if we over, even yeah. if we underestimate it this time, the lag effects are going to take care of that. To that extent, I went back and looked at where we were on unemployment at the peak, which was, I believe, February, March of 2020, and it was 150 million statistic. And, John, we're back to that. Now, we've got immigration. We've got, you know, a larger economy over three, four years. We forget how long it is back. But we've essentially recovered in, in a general way to where we were in 2019. It's taken this long to get back to normal, whatever normal is. Yeah, I, and I think that's the hedge that you got to make. There's a lot of moving parts uh, going. What a privilege to have Governor Krosner on on that. We'll talk jobs with him here. Very cool. He's going to stick around. Mike McKee's <clears throat> going to stay close down in Washington, D.C. He'll break down this number for you in about four minutes' time. Going into payrolls, 185,000 is the estimate in our survey. The previous number, 236. The actual number drops next. <laughs> 